Well, a good Monday morning to you. And uh, I always feel bad stepping on the toes, Sam. Uh, Sam Brooks, the producer of the show. I feel I feel bad stepping on the toes of Ayla Brooke and the Soundman. They do, that was a, a beautiful choice you made, a very nice choice you made with regards to the tunes this morning to kick off our broadcast week. Thank you. I hit, I hit play on my playlist. You hit play on your playlist. Well, then, then take credit for, for an intuitive playlist. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Yeah, that's Sam Brooks, the senior producer of the show. We're excited to be with you uh, for another week here of Real Talk streaming live right now on YouTube via ryanjesperson.com. Maybe you're getting us on the Mixler app. Maybe you're going to be listening a little later on today or even a little later on this week via our podcast. We're so excited about the show that we have in store today. Coming up in about, we'll call it 13 minutes, Sarah Kenzier is going to join us. Uh, if, if, if you know Sarah, you know. And we made the announcement last night that she was going to be on the broadcast. She was going to be on the show today. And people are going nuts. And so we know that many of you, some of, some of you have changed your plan on this Monday morning to make sure you're here live uh, and we're going to be keeping an eye on the YouTube uh, comment threads. We're going to be keeping an eye on our hashtag, Real Talk RJ. If you have a question that you'd like to ask Sarah, uh, she's uh, the author of the New York Times bestseller, uh, Hiding in Plain Sight. That's her most recent book. Also, The View from Flyover Country and uh, co-host of a very popular podcast, Gaslit Nation, uh, that and we're going to ask Sarah about this can can really take credit. I mean, when you're on the record, you're on the record. Can take credit for a number of of political predictions in the United States. Uh, they've they've honed in on the Trump administration. Uh, Sarah Kenzier was talking about Donald Trump in in her her opinion columns. You you've read her probably a ton in the Globe and Mail. She does a lot of work down in the United States and and uh, in in foreign broadcast markets as well. Uh, you know the, the BBC as an example, Al Jazeera around the world. Uh, her commentary has been sought out for the insight that she has on the the authoritarian tactics that that 45 exhibited. And of course, now everybody's interested to know what does the transition look like? What happens on on January 20th on Inauguration Day or before that? Will Donald Trump you know, refuse to leave, so to speak? If so, what happens? What do potential prosecutions look like once 46 takes office. I mean, there's a ton of ground we hope to cover with Sarah Kenzier. We're also going to talk to Steven Anderson today. You can see our lineup if you follow me on Twitter or on my Instagram story every weekday morning. Uh, Steven reached out. We're really excited about this conversation. He reached out to us and he basically said, you know, maybe someday I can be on the show to talk about trades and education funding and, and basically the youth, the leaders of tomorrow. We said, yeah, like how does Monday morning sound? The guy's passionate. We are keeping an eye. I mean, social media is not everything. But we've been keeping an eye on his social media following. He had, back in December of, of 2019, I think it was, like 20 followers on Twitter. <clears throat> he's got now, I, I don't know, 12,500, something like that. Clearly what he's saying is resonating. He's a fourth-generation Alberta millwright. This guy's story is fascinating. We're going to get into that right around 9 o'clock. Gene Principe, the legendary NHL reporter from Sportsnet, will join us to talk about what's coming up in January. The National Hockey League returning to action. That's the plan. And as we wrap up the show today, Dr. Amy Tan, she's a palliative care and family physician out of Victoria, of Vancouver Island. And she's written a really interesting piece about how Christmas is going to be different this year. Her piece looks back to her and her family's different holiday season a number of years ago and, and, and puts into context what I think this December looks like for a lot of people. Regardless of how you celebrate the holidays, it certainly will be different. That also tees up nicely our Y station, our official Get Real Question of the Week. You remember last week we invited you to join our Real Talk panel. This is an invite that's open to everybody. We want to know who you are, what makes you tick, what sort of content are you looking for on a podcast or a live stream like this. Where do you come from? What's your background with regards to perspective, with regards to how you form your opinions? We want to have a meaningful understanding of this audience and, of course, we want to make sure that we're presenting content to you and diving into conversations that you care about. Well, last week, our inaugural question of the week, we asked you how you plan to celebrate, with all things considered with COVID, our question of the week. Look at this. How do you plan on celebrating the holidays this year? And you can see some interesting preliminary numbers. We're going to jump into these in just a second. Sam, first, before we go any further, why don't we remind our friends tuning in right now why we're able to do this each and every morning. It's thanks in huge part to the team at Bitcoin Well, our official presenting sponsor, the presenting sponsor of Real Talk. We've been 
telling you they're going public soon, which is a really exciting time for them. If you're thinking Bitcoin, put it this way. Let me just cut to the chase. If you're thinking that this year might be perfect for putting a little something different under the tree, if you're looking for a little something different to, to intrigue people, to maybe get somebody started on a, on a different track when it comes to their investments, their hobbies, their interests, why not take a look at Bitcoin? At Bitcoin, well, whether you, you want to get in at 50 bucks or, 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 or maybe you want to buy a whole coin, Bitcoin Well is the team to look to for help. You know, they have Bitcoin gift cards. How cool are those for stocking stuffers or whatever else? You can find them via the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Let's get into it. Real talk starts now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. As mentioned, uh, Sarah Kenzer coming up in about nine minutes' time, uh, the author of Hiding in Plain Sight, the co-host of the Gaslit Nation podcast. And what's really great right now is we're seeing on uh, our Real Talk RJ hashtag on Twitter, uh, and I'm going to take a look at YouTube in just a second, suggested questions coming in already. Many of you, I can tell by the tone of your questions or the specificity of them, that you're probably fans of Sarah, that you're, you're following her work and you probably have for years. So uh, certainly hoping uh, that, that you'll continue that trend and keep uh, letting us know what you're most interested to hear about so far. And I'm surveying these in real time. So this is not a scientific statistic, unlike the ones that I'm going to put in front of you just a second on a different line. But I would say so far, the majority of the or at least, you know, the, 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 the recurring question, the significant recurring question from you for Sarah Kenzer this morning. Uh, what does she believe the Biden administration will do with regards to prosecution of perhaps uh, some of the uh, the significant players in Trump's administration. We'll get to her take on what she thinks is coming up there. Also, on a somber note, uh, interesting to note uh, today, the eighth anniversary of the Sandy Hook massacre. This is one of those ones I don't know about you, myself, working in, in broadcast news media, having hosted TV and radio shows. There are certain mornings news mornings that stick out in my mind, uh, ones that I won't soon forget. And Sandy Hook, absolutely, without a doubt, is one of those. You remember where you were when you first heard about it, when the first reports surfaced. You, you, you remember that shocking feeling, uh, another mass shooting in the United States, uh, got punch, right? At a school, uh, got punch at an elementary school, and then the story got worse and worse and worse, one of the, the great American uh, tragedies. Uh, and in the context of mass shootings, that's saying something, considering how many there have been. Uh, you remember, I think many people thought that Sandy Hook would be the event that turned the tide in the United States on the gun discussion in the United States, and I think it's fair to suggest uh, not to be a pessimist, but to be a realist, that I don't think that that has happened. Uh, and I, and I've, I've seen other people suggest that if Sandy Hook didn't turn the tide, nothing would. And that may very well be the case. Uh, I hate to approach with such a, a glass half empty uh, reasoning there, but I think it's safe to say. Uh, when it comes to scientific uh, reporting or statistics. We're proud to partner with Y Station. Y Station is, is Real Talk's official partner when it comes to research and strategy. And again, we've asked you to sign up for our uh, Get Real question of the week. Those of you that did last week, again, Sam, let's put that graphic up. I, I was curious to get into these results. We received the results. Uh, a good number of you, I think about 300 of you, signed up in week number one to be part of this Real Talk panel, which is great. Ultimately, we'd like to grow that. We'd like to get to a point where, where we see, you know, uh, three, four, five thousand people as, as part of that panel, uh, which would be good. Uh, again, Sarah Kenzier coming up at 845 this morning. So set your alarms and get ready for that. In the meantime, we get into our Get Real Question of the Week with everything happening around COVID. And we worded that uh, specifically or strategically, I should say, to include things like, uh, you know, provincial uh, crackdown measures, um, some of the, the, the rates that we're seeing of, of spread. And we're going to get to those in our news and our headlines coming up in 20 minutes. 
how do you plan on celebrating the holidays this year? Now, keep in mind, people can answer more than one uh, item. You could make more than one selection. So if you're thinking the math doesn't add up here, that's more than 100. You know, someone that's celebrating with their household only may also be, for example, dropping gifts on doorsteps, right? So seven in 10 respondents. These are real talk viewers and listeners. This is from the Real Talk panel, okay? 70% of you that responded uh, intend to celebrate the holidays with your household only. 41%, just over 4 out of 10 of you will be dropping gifts on people's doorsteps. 31% uh, observing distanced outdoor activities, whether that's skating on the ODR, whether that's snowboarding or skiing, cross-country skiing, whatever that is. How about this? 3% of you, uh, 3% of you, uh, at least were honest, (laughs) <laughs> suggested uh, that you will be breaking the rules, that it will be business as usual. Uh, so uh, some other interesting numbers in there, and we'll get into those as uh, as the day and the show stretches on. Then, of course, we're going to be talking to you about uh, week two, uh, week two's question of the week, and that's going to be coming up. As a matter of fact, let me do in real time, Sam Brooks. I'm going to take a look at this and see if it's up on our website. If you go to ryanjesperson.com, you know what? I bet you it's already there. If you click on question of the week right at the top, okay, so it's we're still on the other one there. So with everything around COVID, how do you plan on celebrating the holidays this year? We intended to launch it tomorrow, really, so it would be ahead of schedule. But we'll let you know when the link is updated. We invite you to swing on by our website at ryanjesperson.com and answer that question of the week. Um, have you thought, Sam, have you been thinking uh, with regards to you personally how – this holiday season will look different, uh, if at all. I mean, I, I guess it's obviously inherently different for everybody, but what about in your neck of the woods? Yeah, I I mean, <laughs> looking at, at a couple of the options on there, the, the whole notion of dropping gifts on doorsteps and, and staying home, I mean, it, it's, you know, the a thing that has been sort of hitting me lately is in, I'm, I'm 31 years old, and of the first 30 Christmases of my life, I have been in my pajamas at my parents' house on Christmas morning. And that's, you know, that's just a thing that uh, that we can't do this year. And that's just, you know, it, it's it's hard to uh, it's hard to it, it's hard to wrap your head around that. And it's hard to adapt and it's hard to cope. I'm very fortunate that all of my family are here in the city with me anyways. Yeah. So probably what my fiance and I are going to do is is a bit of a just sort of like a uh, we're we're gonna drive to everyone's house on Christmas Day and just sort of stand like outside it. and have like a you know a wave. Uh, this weekend, I was putting up Christmas lights and uh, and had an ongoing beer exchange with my neighbor. We'd just leave beers for each other on each other's doorsteps. That was great. So yeah. there's there's ways you can still connect. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know what those of you at home uh, or wherever you're watching us from, wherever you're tuning in from this morning, what you're going to be doing. Uh, I, I can't get over this. I mean, this is not uh, it's not losing its uh, sort of magical influence on on how the two of us feel here in the Real Talk studio. When everybody sh- signs in in the morning and the YouTube comment thread is just a bunch of new friends wishing each other a good morning. This is uh, I, I feel like we're going to break the Internet with the kindness and the civility. How does that ever happen? What, what is going on right now? I know. Just, everyone's treating each other with respect. Uh, I, it might have something to do with Professor Joni Avram and Dr. Jody Carrington's roundtable with us on Friday. If you missed that, uh, absolutely unbelievable stuff. Uh, the the perspective that they brought to the table with regards to meeting people in the middle, with regards to pu- uh, pursuing civil conversations, uh, blew our minds. Which is kind of sad that something so reasonable, you know, Professor Avram brought to the table some polling that she did out of uh, basically out of her practice. She's a, a management consultant and and does a whole bunch of things on on human communication the art of connection it shows that more than 80 percent of us 81 percent of the respondents to her survey and there were there were about 1500 respondents suggested that they could find they believed they could find middle ground with people with whom they disagree that they could find an opportunity an avenue for discussion to hash out issues where they don't necessarily see eye to eye which i thought was encouraging and absolutely amazing very quickly, want to give a shout out this morning to the teams at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. You know, it's, it, the temperature's starting to drop here in Western Canada, regardless of where you're watching us from. Unless, I mean, unless you're like, you know, Laws that tunes in every morning from Dominical and Costa Rica or, or some of our listeners like, oh, hey, by the way, Dr. Stephen Duckett on the show later this week. Remember, Dr. Stephen Duckett, 10 years after the cookie incident, he's back at home in his native Australia uh, quarterbacking or at least commenting uh, from his position as a health advisor on Australia's COVID response. He's going to join us. Uh, that's coming up a little bit later on this week. As a matter of fact, tomorrow, a special broadcast event, 2 p.m. So, yeah, you're watching from Costa or Australia. Disregard all the talk about snow and ice. But if you're going to be dealing with the Canadian winter, why not do it in a 2020 Jeep Grand Cherokee, St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge, your home, your best 
destination for Jeeps in the province of Alberta. Scott and his team want your business, and we're grateful for theirs here on Real Talk. Let's get to our leadoff guest this morning. Uh, it's been a while since we've been this excited about somebody joining us. She has a huge following as a New York Times bestselling author. Her most recent book, Hiding in Plain Sight, also The View from Flyover Country. You've read her in a ton of publications, including here in Canada, in the Globe and Mail. You've likely seen her on MSNBC, on CBS, on the BBC, and of course her podcast, uh, which she co-hosts with Andrew Chalupa, Gaslit Nation. It's a real pleasure to welcome to the program Sarah Kenzier. Welcome to Real Talk and a good Monday morning to you, Sarah. Oh, thank you for having me. This is, well, we want to get right to it because there's a, there's a lot of ground to cover. And I, and I was telling our, our audience this morning, our live audience, that, that many of the questions that we're receiving already for you center around what you predict the Biden administration will do with regards to pursuing criminal charges or, or with regards to pursuing what some are simply saying justice in the face of what they would describe as, as corruption. I want to get to that in just a second, but it must say something to you that many people, so many people see you as, as, as some sort of a sage. The power of prediction has been strong with you over the past five or six years. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, I don't think of myself so much that way. I think I just have a flair for the obvious. And, you know, what I've been studying throughout my career is authoritarian regimes, corruption, the erosion of institutions. And those things are all happening in the United States and globally. This is a global crisis. Now, you uh, you have gone on the record to say that, you know, no longer can American citizens look at other countries, developing nations or otherwise, and and take a look at, at, at corruption and say that can't happen here. What was different about this? This administration versus any uh, previous in the uh, in American history. I mean, a lot of people like to look at Trump as a fluke or an aberration, and I see him as a culmination. I see him as the result of horrific trends um, that have continued for you know my entire lifetime for 40 years, but have roots before that in the systemic racism of the United States government and greed. Um, what's different about now is that it's all laid out on the table. It's difficult for people to deny it. And Trump flaunts his crimes. His whole administration and his backers flaunt their crimes. The problem is elite criminal impunity. They don't face um, any fear of you know punishment or consequences for what they've done to this country, even after uh, the coronavirus crisis. And so that is what we need to be working on looking to the future under the Biden administration because none of this is going to go away and it's all going to get um, just it, the, the worst it's going to get will be dependent on how much we're willing to acknowledge the problem and face it head on. You and your uh, co-host on Gaslit Nation have described this in, as an attempted coup. Uh, what do you think is going to happen between now and, and Biden's planned inauguration on January 20th? What are you forecasting? I mean, do you think Donald Trump literally is going to try to refuse to leave the White House? I mean, I'm very worried. I'm not sure it's going to happen between now and like the end of today, in part because, you know, the electors are uh, meeting today and casting votes. Trump is not just doing this as a grift and to make money, although everything he does has that as some sort of uh, side benefit. You know, he's always pulling a heist. He's doing it uh, in an attempt to maintain full power. And the reason he wants that is both for financial reasons and for immunity from prosecution. He wants to continue the dynastic kleptocracy that he was beginning to build by installing Ivanka and Jared uh, into office. And the Republicans want this. You know, this, is, this isn't Trump's idea. He's not some sort of geopolitical mastermind. He's someone who Republicans take advantage of, and he takes advantage of Republicans. And it's a symbiotic relationship. And they've made an enormous amount of money and garnered an enormous amount of power by gutting uh, our institutions and removing any barriers that they might have uh, experienced in the past to doing this. So they they will keep fighting. You know, first they basically tried to rig it. They destroyed postal service equipment. They tried to block mail-in votes. They created a narrative of electoral fraud um, that had no basis in reality. Then they went to the courts. They got defeated over 50 times, and then they got defeated by the Supreme Court. The next step is violence, and we saw we saw that over the weekend. We saw the Proud Boys and other white supremacist groups uh, going around uh, tearing, um, you know, posters off of black churches, defacing them, uh, you know, acting like little stormtroopers. 
this is serious and it will get worse uh, the closer that we get to inauguration because part of what has happened recently is I don't think that the fanatical part of Trump's base really thought that he lost. They just thought it was a matter of time for things to get worked out in court, especially because Trump had packed the courts. You know, they thought, well, they'll just rule in his favor. It's beginning to sink into them that he, he really did lose uh, and they're going to need to resort to other tactics if they want to keep him in office. And those tactics are not legal. They're violent. Um, and that's what happens in a coup you know everybody was like oh you can't have a coup it's illegal it's like dude that's like literally the definition of a coup it's an illegal uh taking of power you know like that's that's how it goes we just um haven't had a media experience of that before in the united states and so i think uh, naturally people are confused but they shouldn't rule out any possibility sarah kens you're our guest sarah uh, heather's uh watching this morning and and she's uh she's thrilled that you're here on the show by the way she says that she's reading uh, your book right now, Hiding in Plain Sight. Uh, Heather says, you know, even if you think that you knew everything about Donald Trump, this book is hugely eye-opening. Uh, for people that, that follow the 24-hour news cycle that are constantly on Twitter, people that believe that they've seen it all, which is saying something when it comes to the Trump administration, what did you manage, do you think, as a theme uh, or as a, a tidbit even to uncover in your book that you don't think most people realize that you found to be quite profound or important? Well, I think a lot of people assume that Trump is a political neophyte, that he's incompetent, that he doesn't know what he's doing. What he is, is a career criminal who has been linked to transnational organized crime for 40 years. And I'm not the first person to point this out. Back in the 1980s and 1990s, this was reported on in real time. You know, there's like, I don't know, 40 or 50 pages of endnotes in my book because this is so well documented. What happened is he got a career makeover from The Apprentice, but then and also because of the media, because they were uh, timid, they were threatened, they were greedy, they wanted him to win, so they blocked this story out. But Trump is backed by the Russian mafia. The Russian mafia invested in his properties. They brought him back to life after his bankruptcies. He's also been tied not just to the Kremlin, um, but people in his circle are tied to illicit actors from Israel, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, a lot of people involved in Iran-Contra in, in Iran -Contra or the cover-up uh, of Iran-Contra. You even see that with Bill Barr getting installed in the administration, which is something that happened while I was writing the book. It's a continuum. It's the same people over and over again, Manafort, Stone, you know, the, this little core group of uh, individuals that have been working against the United States in tandem for 40 years and have been trying to turn the Republican into the Republican Party into uh, basically, you know, the, the rulers of a one party autocratic state. A lot of what I wrote in Hiding in Plain Sight in 2019 has now come true in a very blatant way that I think people see in 2020. When I was saying this stuff a year ago, you know, people thought I was nuts or I was exaggerating. It's there and, and it's very frustrating to me that it's been there the whole time in the public domain, documented, not just by me, but by many other journalists who did the thing that Trump doesn't want you to do, which is follow the money. Because when you follow the money, you end back at transnational organized crime. And that's who's pulling the strings on this operation and on Brexit and on a lot of terrible things happening worldwide. Sir, I think that, that your frank talk and, and I think that, uh, I mean, the fact that sometimes you communicate very effectively with a flamethrower is, is so important because, <laughs> you know, so many people will talk. I mean, people will invoke the idea of TDS, right? You've probably heard this more than anybody on planet earth this trump derangement syndrome they'll they'll paint you they'll gaslight you uh, or attempt to anyway as 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 somebody who simply has an axe to grind against donald trump which is why you're honing in on all of these things if you look generally though it, it's remarkable to think that uh, of course someone like donald trump has a rabid base right but then you also have he has more than 70 million people that voted for him uh, is, is there a difference between the rabid base and the 70 million? And if so, what is it? And, and where do you put the both of them, you know, present day with regards to their mindset on, on what they're seeing with Donald Trump and the future of the Republican Party, for that matter? Yeah, I think there's an enormous difference between the voters and the base. And I say this because I live in Missouri. I live in a state that voted for him twice, um, you know, in pretty large numbers. And that has a, you know, almost entirely GOP legislature. So I'm not coming from the coasts. You know, I, I see these differences in, uh, you know, behavior. The base I think of as people who would actually take to the streets and commit acts of violence in Trump's name. The voters are people, you know, who I do judge for their terrible decision to vote for Donald Trump. 
Trump because, you know, I think a lot of them, they, they just don't like anybody. They're disillusioned people. I think that honestly describes the majority of Americans, uh, regardless of party, but they're willing to overlook his cruelty, his racism, his xenophobia, uh, his criminality. Although I have to say, a lot of them don't know. They are living in information silos. They're getting their information from, from Fox News or OAN or other very hardcore uh, right-wing resources. And I've gotten emails from former Trump voters that read Iding in plain sight and were like, oh my God, you know, had I known, had the media told me this stuff, the corruption stuff, the criminality stuff, the fact that he is the quote unquote deep state, you know, this is a narrative that the Trump folks love to pump into people's heads, that Trump is fighting the, the deep state. This is a guy who has had all his crimes hidden by the FBI, hidden by the intelligence agencies, who's deeply entrenched in American political politics. He's not some radical outsider. And I think that once that kind of gets into people's heads and they, they see that, they're like, oh, well, you know, he was not who I, who I thought I, you know, I, who I thought he was. And you could say, well, what about all the things he said in public for four years? But, you know, nonetheless, I'm very happy when people see the light because I think he's terrible for everyone. He's obviously worse for Americans who are marginalized, who are vulnerable, who are persecuted by his administration. But as someone living in Missouri, he's also very bad for the Trump voters. Like they're not getting anything out of this situation except for coronavirus. You know, there, there's no benefit uh, for them. And so, you know, that that's the way it goes. And so I hope that, uh, you know, anyone who wants to read this book or the other books that detail the criminality and the elite criminal impunity, um, I hope they go on and do so because everyone should know the truth. In your estimation, what does Joe Biden do with all of this? Joe Biden has got to, uh, you know, call a lie a lie and a crime a crime and stop trying to reach across the aisle to people who want to smack him in the face. I mean, that's what's going on. Like they're out there doing things like threatening to, you know, blow up City Hall in Michigan, um, you know, making up horrendous stories about Biden. Like the base, the core group here, it, are, they're just not people you can reason with. And that includes people like Mitch McConnell in the Senate who has been abusing power, uh, you know, for a very long Long time. Like these are not people interested in a good faith argument and they're not people interested in serving the American public. And that needs to be Joe Biden's priority is serving the American public. And the biggest crisis we have now is obviously uh, coronavirus. And he has to work at um, establishing trust in a vaccine and getting folks who are skeptical of the vaccine uh, to take it. And that's a very hard thing. So what I would encourage him to do is have some sort of presidential crimes commission, um, you know, to examine the things that Trump and his cohort did in office and in the campaign. And this includes how they handled the coronavirus with shakedowns, inside trading, things like that, uh, the abuse of migrants at the border, obstruction of justice and the other crimes laid out in the Mueller report, uh, you know, treason, quite honestly, uh, given their relationships with Russia. I mean, it goes on and on. I'll be here all day if I list them. It's too much for just like Joe Biden and his immediate cabinet um, to handle. So I would encourage the formation of a transparent investigatory committee, a committee that's telling the American people play by play, here's what we found out, here's some documentation, because no one's going to believe it based on trust. They need to see the evidence and there needs to stop being this, oh, well, you know, we can't tell you for this reason or that. You know, no government institution has jurisdiction over the truth. And I hope that the Biden administration understands that. Sarah, uh, so grateful for your time this morning. I I'm curious to know, I mean, I know that you you've been published in the Globe and Mail many times, typically, though, writing uh, from an American perspective about American politics. Do you pay attention uh, to political movements, political parties, political trends in in Canada uh, or in Alberta, the province from which we broadcast every morning? Is there anything on your radar of interest that you're paying attention to in Canada? Yeah, I mean, I, I do to some extent, and I certainly get a lot of uh, email and tweets uh, from Canadian readers. I'm very grateful for that. I've gotten a lot in the last uh, year or two from folks in Alberta who are, uh, you know, worried about Kenny, worried about conservatives there, uh, you know, worried about a lot of the same things, honestly, I worry about in Missouri living under a GOP legislature, um, you know, that we have a government that has no interest in serving the public. They want to just exploit um, our, you know, natural resources 
Texas. That's something I hear a lot from Albertans. And then I also hear them sort of looking at Trump, looking at the fate of the nation as a whole, looking at secessionist movements, for example, in Canada. And we have an eruption of that right now um, in the United States. We have, you know, Texas calling for secession and whatnot. That's something Canada has had to deal with for a long time. So, you know, what I always tell Canadians is just treasure what you have, like treasure the democracy you have, the healthcare system you have, environmental protections you have, things like that. Never take it for granted and never assume that the worst possible person cannot get into office because voters will know better or the media will tell you the truth. Like those unfortunately are, are things you can't assume and you, you just can't take anything for granted. So please fight for your democracy because you know we need you. <laughs> we're we're at your border and uh, we don't want to we don't want to flee there, but we want you to do well because when you know when, when both our countries do well, then we all benefit. I'll agree with you there a hundred percent. Sarah Kenzer is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Hiding in Plain Sight, co-host of the wildly popular podcast Gaslit Nation. Uh, Sarah, I want to thank you so much for joining us on the show this morning and wish you best of luck with your continued commentary. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Make sure you follow Sarah Kenzier on Twitter. And of course, you can subscribe to her podcast anywhere you subscribe to great podcasts. How's that? Man, I'm looking forward to our next conversation with her, uh, to be sure. Wanted to give a shout out to the team at Local Waste this morning. Of course, they sponsor Trash Talk every Friday. And if you missed Trash Talk, it's basically three and a half, four minutes where we get to, well, blow a gasket. We get to read your emails, your rants, your raves, and it's become quickly one of the most popular four minutes of our entire broadcast week. Well, Local Waste through the week themselves for more than 25 years have been uh, owned and operated locally, your waste management solution. Of course, they also handle recycling and everything else. That's part of the service offering. It's not just garbage trucks, and they're looking to expand too partnerships is what they're all about so those entrepreneurs out there that may have an idea for your community why not bring in local waste in partnership with chris labos here and his team if you want to learn more about that or if you want to talk to the team at local waste about their service offerings maybe you own a business maybe you're in charge of a big residential complex you can give them a call at 780-242-9746 or visit localwaste.ca Let's take a look at what's making news on this Monday morning. Hard to believe it's December 14th already, isn't it? Well, we're going to start hearing about long-term care residents, frontline health workers, and and then ultimately others receiving the first batch of vaccines, that two-dose vaccine. And I'm not sure if you saw over the weekend, but some of the videos of, of, uh, you know, courier trucks, the big rigs leaving these manufacturing warehouses and workers just clapping people literally lining the streets like some sort of a ticker tape parade celebrating these vaccines hitting uh, members of the public a two-dose vaccine as mentioned found to be 95 percent effective this is the uh pfizer biontech vaccine in a large-scale trial it's the fastest vaccine uh, in human history, uh, developed over the course of uh, just a, a short while. As a matter of fact, though, BioNTech co-founder, it's a German company, uh, Ugar Sahin is the co-founder of BioNTech, uh, told the Journal, uh, as well as the Wall Street Journal, uh, out of the UK and the United States, the vaccine was actually developed over just a few hours. The idea, they build the idea of a vaccine Don't ask me to explain how it works. I barely passed biology in grade 12. But they build the idea of a vaccine, and then they approach it from the angle of will it work. They said that they built this one in a matter of hours. How wild is that? Meantime, we told you last week that British authorities were warning those with allergies to approach the vaccine with caution. They've since clarified their concerns, uh, changing the wording from severe allergic reactions to specify the vaccine should not be going to anybody who has ever had an anaphylactic reaction to previous vaccines, prescription medications, or food. They say that type of reaction is very rare, but they're going to be keeping an eye on it. And of course, so will we. And we'll update you as that information becomes more relevant. And close to home here in our home province of Alberta in Western Canada, wanted to take a look at Alberta's COVID numbers. Uh, We're on the wrong end of the spectrum when it comes to where Canada's at nationally. 
Uh, Sam, if we call up Sunday's numbers, you'll see about 1,700 new cases announced yesterday. That's 1,717. That brings uh, the death total in Alberta after 22 yesterday. These are 22 human beings, 22 people. 719 Albertans have lost their lives to COVID-19 with 136 of them in the ICU. Keep in mind, that's a really big deal. 136 Albertans right now in ICU, in intensive care due to COVID-19. That is uh, getting close to the capacity that most doctors are telling us would really, really, really be a serious problem. In other words, that 600 number that we're hearing from the Alberta government with regards to ICU capacity, you remember Dr. Shazma Mathani the other day was on the show, an ER physician at the Stollery Children's Hospital and the Royal Alexandra Hospital in Alberta's capital city here in Edmonton. She said, you may have the ventilators, you may have 600 beds, but if you don't have the doctors and the nurses and the respiratory techs and everybody else to look after those patients, you don't have the capacity. She pegged it closer to 200, so 136 is a really big deal. We're going to get to more uh, data, some interesting uh, information gleaned from our Get Real Question of the Week brought to you by Y Station. Those of you that told us what your plan is uh, with regards to how you're going to be spending your holidays in light of COVID. And we're going to get to that a little bit later on in the show. But, but right now, I'm eager for this conversation. Let's be very clear. You're going to hear from the so-called big players on this show, many of them, right? The Deputy Prime Minister, Christian Freeland, was on last week. Mayor Don Iveson in Edmonton uh, giving us the exclusive on our first show, whether you know he's announcing he won't seek re-election. We're going to get that. We're going to bring you the politicians. And, and you're going to hear from the executive directors and the general managers and the, and the, and the, the executive branch of many of the, the businesses that make things happen here. You're, you're going to hear from the recognizable names. But we're also really going to prioritize conversations with people that know, because they're walking miles in their boots, people that know firsthand why issues really matter. And a big part of our editorial process in in booking guests, in understanding what you want to hear more about is based on you reaching out to us right? You putting things on our radar. You can reach us anytime uh, by sending an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com, or you can hit me up on Twitter. Make sure you use the hashtag RealTalkRJ. That's what our next guest did. Uh, Steven Anderson spent more than a decade working across the province of Alberta as a certified millwright, in other words, an industrial mechanic. Get this, as a matter of fact, a fourth generation Alberta millwright. He's worked for all the big oil and gas and Fort McMurray, Suncor, Syncrude, you name it. We're going to get into that. And now he's in front of the leaders of today and tomorrow, our students as a teacher here in the province of Alberta. Stephen Anderson reached out to the show, and we're thrilled to have him making his debut today. And in, in, in what I can say, I think, uh, without one iota of controversy, uh, the greatest beard that this show has to this <laughs> to this point, Stephen, ever seen. So welcome to Real Talk, and thanks for making time for us this morning. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, you've got. I can see you've got your, uh, and I can't see the full sign, but it looks like I love public education over your shoulder. Um, I know that you're proud of of your career as a teacher here. There we have it. I love Alberta public education. What was it before we really dig into it? And we've got lots of time here, Stephen, to hash this out. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, so feel free to take the reins. But what was it specifically that prompted you to reach out to our show? Why are you so concerned right now about the state of education in Alberta? Um, you know, I, the, I'll tell you one of the biggest things that really concerns me. Um, and, you know, I, I was thinking about this a lot about how I don't want to get angry right off the bat with you, but, uh, and not with at you, uh, I mean, to be clear, one of the things that's really driving me crazy in this province right now, and is really, really getting me down is this, um, this division, this division that's being caused by our current government. Um, I'm so tired of it. Uh, having, having come from the public or from the private sector, having been a tradesperson, now working in the public sector, I don't see it as us versus them. I see it as us. And I am so tired of it, it oil and gas, oil and gas, while, while we're cutting education, cutting healthcare. Um, it, 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 it isn't, they're not two separate things. We should be united, not divided. And that, that is one of the biggest reasons. That's one of the biggest things I would like to see changed in Alberta. Um, you know, how are we going to get an economy rebuilt 
without education, without uh, without funding for our, our youth, without creating jobs for our youth, without maybe looking at things differently. So I think that was one of the big things. I mean, I also just love your show, Ryan. And, you know, um, I, I was hoping that it would be a good place that we could have a real talk like your show. I love it. Music uh, to my ears, Stephen. You know what I think is really important? And and, and I, I sort of, uh, I, I was eager to get to our conversation. And so I, I probably cut short an introduction that could have gone on and on and on um, because you've provided us with a lot of great information, basically your CV, which I think is important for this conversation. Because when we talk about, out diversifying Alberta's economy or when we talk about investing in Alberta or when we talk about uh, an innovation economy in Alberta, I think it, it can prove to be a divisive conversation where you say this government is so focused on or so committed to or they're so pot committed on oil and gas that they're not looking at other things. It's easy for a government, spokespersons for government or supporters of the government to paint you as anti-Canadian energy, as anti-oil and gas. I just want to reiterate, I mean, you've worked at Suncor and Syncrude and other players in Fort McMurray. You've worked in Edmonton refineries like Shell Scottford in Petro-Canada. You've worked in coal-fired power generation. Uh, you know, you've worked in pulp and paper and a whole bunch of other stuff as well. So in my mind, you approach this from a position with a lot of credibility, having earned a living in oil and gas, knowing a ton about oil and gas. So what does it do to you when you see that division in public discourse right now in Alberta? It's, it's undeniable. Well, I mean, it is, and it, and it isn't like, this is the thing I want to be very like, I, I, I mean, it's been over 12 years. I've been teaching for 12 years. I worked for roughly 10 before that in oil and gas. Um, and, and the thing is, is that I want to be very clear. And this is one of the reasons I really wanted to come on your show. I don't know one single teacher who claps or is happy when an oil and gas worker loses their job. Yeah. I don't know any one of us that, that doesn't have a little hurt in our heart, doesn't cry a little bit thinking about all these families that have lost their jobs. We are not against you. We are not uh, happy about the situation. We, we recognize that, that uh, you know, that, that there, I recognize without a doubt the amount of hard work that these people do. I mean, you spend 24 days on and four days off up in, a, in an eight foot room uh, in, in a camp up uh, an hour north of Fort McMurray, uh, away from your family. I mean, there's uh, there's no doubt. But that's the thing, though, right? How do I, right now? What I mean, I went into teaching because I did not like school. I did not. Uh, I'd rather work with my hands. I, I really enjoyed that. But I always felt that uh, that um, you know that school. One of the things school was lacking in a lot of times when I was in school was that. We, you know, trades programs, what are, you know, not all of us are going to university. And so it's, it's a key part of rebuilding our economy is to keep these, these young people trained, um, instill work ethic, um, show them the safety, help them out. But it's hard. It's getting harder and harder for me to do my job because when I first started in 2008, during the boom, I could sell it. I could, I wrote on the board the very first day, this is how much money you could make. This is how incredible it is. Now, what do I say, right? Right now, I'm, I'm trying to get my students uh, all the certifications they can get because I know how competitive it, it is out there. I know how tough it is. And, you know, it, it, it kind of breaks my heart trying to, you know, when they ask, like, well, how do I go about getting a job? You know, um, it, it, it's rough. It's rough out there. And I feel bad for them. I feel bad for the people working now. Uh, I, I wish things would change. I wish we'd have a larger conversation. I think education is key uh key to to our to our economy and and seeing seeing the cuts and there are no doubt there are massive cuts okay i know the government's telling us well no we're, we're funding's the same okay yes but we have thirteen thousand more students all right um and then we look at things like the like uh it, it roughly 440 dollars less per student now what the thing is is i am no fan of this government i wasn't before i'm not a conservative but i i I honestly like, I thought, okay, well, here we go. This is the party of oil and gas. They're going to help out public education. They're gonna help out um, metal fabrication programs such as mine. Uh, I'm still waiting. Um, now our school division has done an amazing job. Our school does an amazing job. But the thing is when you take that money and you think about that $441 per student, you take that money out of the school division. The school division has to, has to decide what schools get it. Then the principal has to decide what programs get it. You take that massive amount of money, which is equivalent to six, seven percent, 
right? And a lot of those things don't change, such as the building, heat, electricity. You take that amount of money and they have to start looking at things. And the truth is, are they going to cut math? Or, are they, or is the hard decision going to be made that maybe we need to cut fabrication? Maybe we need to cut uh, commercial foods. Maybe we need to cut the drama program. And this is the key that school is not just about learning to read and write and study Shakespeare. It is about discovering what you want to do for the rest of your life. It is trying new things. And, and you take that away. We have a government who talks about choice and education, yet they're taking the choices in education away by defunding public education. Steven, we've got uh, comments here that I want to get to uh, on our YouTube live stream. So these are people that are watching right now. Um, Shayla says, uh, speaking as someone who held a role as a post-secondary education advocate in Alberta, if the Alberta government cared about the future of oil and gas workers, they would fund post-secondary education. She says the idea that trades are lesser than are a government-stoked argument to pit liberal arts education and trades against each other. You're nodding. Uh, do you see that firsthand? Oh, for sure. And, and you know, I was going to get to post-secondary education. I mean, you look, one, of the, one of the first things that, that this government did was, uh, did was cut funding to, to world-class institutions like Nate and SAIT. I went to Nate for my trade ticket. And, you know, this is one thing I, I, I love telling people. And, you know, I, so I have a university degree. I did my four full year, uh, four year bachelor of education degree. I did my, I went to Nate for the four, four years or the four two month in, I got my trade ticket and I had way more difficulty. Uh, I found getting my trade ticket was much more difficult. This is the thing that a lot of people don't understand about the trades. It's not, you know, it, you're not digging a ditch. You're a skilled, qualified, certified trades person. You've learned you in university. I could talk about the different ways we can educate children, right? You could, you could say this and then there's this way and there's not really a wrong answer. At Nate, you either know how to, uh, that turbine either runs or it doesn't. That weld either it holds together or it doesn't. There is no, you know, and that, that's the thing. That's, uh, and, and this government, they talk this big game about, oh, we support oil and gas, oil and gas, but then they cut, they cut a world class, the world class institutions were known around the world as having the best tradespeople in uh, anywhere. And, and, and they, they start with cutting that, right? Why? So that they can boast that 44 that we have the lowest taxes in all of Canada in 44 states. When I hear that, that embarrasses me because I know that comes straight out of our children's future. That comes straight out of our hospitals, and it makes me mad. You know, you'll see me turn red because I've been mad at this government for a long time. I just don't, I don't understand why they don't see things the way we see things. There are cuts. There are our kids. I have a we have a, we have a son. I'm worried for his future. I'm seeing people leaving this province. You know, it it it, it just uh, post secondaries. There's no funding for you know. They talk one big game, but then there's they don't they don't show up. They don't really ante up. They you know and and it is uh, I you know you look at when the tough economic times and you see. Uh, you know, I think the path is to, to, to invest in infrastructure, invest in education, you know, but um, I don't know. Uh, now I'm fired up, Ryan. Well, that's good. <laughs> I mean, I start every show fired up. I walk out fired up. I'm fired up all day. So it's nice to have some company. Rudy is watching it's live. True, he <laughs> is. Yeah, Sam knows it's true. I, I, I operate at 180 beats a minute all the time. Rudy says, nice. uh, Rudy says, uh, there's no more big money. Get over it. If you had to make a compelling argument as to why this government would better invest or more invest in education, uh, what would you say to Rudy? What's your compelling case? Um, to invest in education? Hey, um, hey, man, Rudy's the one that made the comment, not me. He says there's I mean, no more I mean, money. Uh, Get I mean, over it. Is, is a, it. It's disgusting, right? I'm actually disgusted. Uh, my, my good friends, uh, you know, I, I, I was telling you, Ryan, how I, I got on Twitter not long ago, over just over a year ago. Uh, I got a huge following. I'm hearing terrible stories. Um, my good friends would be really upset if I didn't mention this. One of the worst things this government has done is uh, cut, cut funding to, spe to, to special needs children. Um, I, I could talk a lot about our, our the trades programs and, and lots of other things, but really my minor was in special needs and it's near and dear to my heart. And it's one of those things that kind of goes along with, with helping some of my students in the trades because some of them do have special needs. 
Um, you know, you look at how this government cuts speech language pathologists, you look at how they're, you know, these little kids pre-kindergarten, they cut funding to that. How do they, and, and, you know, my wife's a grade one teacher and she sees how the, at that age, when they don't, when, when students don't get the help they need, then they come down to me and, and, and there's not a lot we can do at 15, 16, if they don't get that help early on. I mean, how can you, how can you say, you know what, Rudy, how can you say that you don't, you don't support educating our children? I, I completely disagree. There's absolutely no, no better investment in this future. There are, are in this process, there's no better investment for Alberta's uh, future. Um, if we don't, you know, if we don't have a, a strong educated workforce, we we're, we'll never get out of this. We never will. And, and so now I'm really fired up, Rudy. Thanks. Yeah, you well, you know, quit apologizing for it, Stephen. You know, you do a good job of channeling your energy. Obviously, let, let me ask you. You touched on something. Just as an aside, um, you got on Twitter about a year ago, right? December 2019. Uh, you had 20 followers. You've got about 12 and a half thousand now. You're you're adding about a thousand followers a month. That's not easy to do. What is it? Do you think about you? That's resonating, and, and and no and no offense intended here. What's the difference between you and everybody else that's pissed off and making a lot of noise on social media? Why are people? Why are? Why is your message resonating with so many people? Well, I'll tell you one one key that I do every day. I do a daily Alberta shout out. I recognize one person that's doing an amazing job of standing up and making this place better, um, and that I think has really resonated with well with people. I think, uh, you know, connecting with people, replying to them, listening to their stories. It's not a lot different than what you do, Ryan. I mean, obviously, I don't do it full time and, and it, it, you know, but it, it, it you know, uh, it, I think that I'm in a, I'm, I'm, I'm privileged. OK, I'm extremely privileged. I'm I'm a white, middle aged, straight man. Um, I, and, and this is the thing, though, I, 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 it. There are so many people that deserve better. There are so many people I'm in the a point of privilege where I can I can fight and help those people and I feel that that's a responsibility that more of us need to take on um, you know I could go on I, I was here to talk about education I could talk about uh, I mean I, I briefly talk about people on age the, the disaster the things that the, the way we've treated the marginalized people in our society uh, lately with this government is absolutely deplorable um, uh, my message resonates I think it's it's because uh, I don't know kindness unity um, I, I, I'd like to think that I have a, a, a great way of, of getting people engaged. I mean, one of my goals on uh, getting on Twitter wasn't just to have some large following, it was to drive people to go get out, go out to protest, write your MLAs. I mean, I wouldn't be here today, Ryan, if I didn't, uh, if I didn't already reach out to my MLAs, if I didn't already sit down with them and explain to them that there's no, no fat left to cut in education and that we've been treading water for years. There's no, uh, you know, we, uh, the everybody's under this illusion that under the NDP, there was just all this money and you're dancing through the streets and schools. We weren't. There, there was a couple of grants, um, you know, I, really when you get down to it, education funding hasn't gone up in, in years. Um, and every year our expenses get harder and harder to pay for. I mean, I buy metal, I buy welding rods, I buy, you know, and, 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 and I get to the point where I have to start doing customer service and, and, and trying to bring in money, trying to get grants. Like there's no... It, it it just I guess I guess I, I I wish we could get out and protest. I mean, there's this pandemic, but there's still lots of things that we're doing. I think un, uniting people into into making making Alberta better is important work, and I think uh, you know it has actually really helped my mental health. Knowing that I'm in it, not that I'm not alone. Um, I'm not alone. I have, I have lots of my teacher colleagues have 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 really engaged with me as well as other parents and. And 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 just Albertans and people actually from across the country, across the world, really, because they see. They, I think they see my passion, right? They see my passion for our kids. I don't. I felt so alone in high school. I felt. Uh, I felt like it wasn't made for me. That I wasn't going to university, and there's nothing for me. And that's what I aim to do with my students, right? We're here for them. Uh, we make T-shirts. It's like part of a team, and 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 they become. It, it becomes part of their persona, and I think that's so amazing. And I I just. My big fear, like we're, we're holding our own now. I have a great division. I have a great principal. I have a great school. Um, but I, I truly fear that a few more cuts and all of a sudden there won't be there won't be these amazing choices in education for our students and for 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 our futures. And and that actually really, really hurts. And it's hard to think about. And that's why I'm here today. I think, I think we can 
see it on your face. We can hear it in your voice. We're talking to Stephen Anderson, who's an Alberta teacher, uh, a fourth generation Alberta millwright as well. Uh, in just a second, I, I, I'm going to put you on the spot, though, Stephen, because I guess kind of one of the rules, the premise of these types of conversations is you have to come to the table with a solution. So I want to ask you what that is in just a second. In the meantime, I want to remind our friends how grateful we are to have the support of the team that owns all six Dairy Queens in Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. Mark and Michael are so proud to have been in business for a long time, employing, of course, local people, also giving back to the charities in their community well into the six figures. I've seen some of the numbers. I know these guys are, are modest. They're humble guys, but trust me. These guys are community players, and they're very proud of it. And right now at their six locations, Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, Y Gardens, and Baseline Road, because of the relationship here, you tuning into Real Talk and them partnering with Real Talk, they're making those famous Christmas frozen ice cream logs available for half price until Christmas Day. Don't go to other Dairy Queens and ask for this deal because they're going to look at you like you're nut. They're going to go, what, what are you trying to get some sort of a, what are you trying to invent some sort of a sale? What are you, are you trying to cook up some sort of a promotion? What do you think this is? And then you go, ah, I'm not at a Dairy Queen in Northwest Edmonton or Sherwood Park. My bad. Excuse me. See you later. Thank you very much. And then you get to the, and then you say real talk and then they give you the 50% off. Isn't that beautiful? Pretty sweet, I'd say. Thanks to the team at Dairy Queen for their support and their sponsorship. Let's get back to Stephen Anderson. We've given him 45 seconds to think about this. Uh, Stephen, you got to come to the table with us. Are, are you a little distracted by all the Dairy Queen talk now? It happens. It, you yeah, yeah, you know, I, I do love the Dairy Queen. Yeah, you wouldn't be the first. Um, yeah, <laughs> you have to bring a solution to the table. So you can be critical. Well, yeah. of, you can be critical of government, and government will say, "Well, listen, there's a there's a hole blown in the revenue side. Obviously, Alberta's going to run its biggest deficit by a mile, and and so is pretty much every other government in the world. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, that pandemic related is one thing. Energy markets related is another uh and alberta's in trouble and alberta is uh looking like it might be in trouble for the foreseeable future and so the government will say things like any political leader would say uh, difficult decisions will have to be made so how would you approach this if you were premier well I'll t- i mean the first one uh, and, and you're right it isn't you know in a lot of ways no matter who the premier is and no matter how many bad decisions i can say that they've made it is not easy right now um, this government, I think, has done a really poor job, but it's not easy. Um, it would be a challenge for absolutely anybody. Um, this, uh, I think, I think the biggest one when you really get down to it is when we look at, at I, I think the path maybe we were on before, the path you've seen places like Hughes, uh, Texas, and, and other places around the world. They see the writing on the wall. Um, they, they see, they see these big car manufacturers that are no longer going to make uh, uh, gas engines. Um, and so I think that. Uh, at least some of our efforts should be put at, into diversifying, into into drawing in other businesses. Um, you know, I, I get really upset when when about this all in on oil and gas when we see like there's no, you know, uh, our premier blames the previous premier about all of Alberta's woes. The truth is they can, and it's been Alberta's problem for as long as I've been alive and a lot longer. We don't control the price of oil. Um, but we can control a lot of other things. And so I think, I think that's one of the big steps is looking at, you know, I'm, I'm a journeyman millwright. I can work on coal fired turbines. I can work on wind turbines. I can work, you know, like we, we can, uh, there's a way to, to, to still keep tradespeople working, but in a slightly different way. And one that's maybe a lot more uh, long-term. Um, I, I think, I think that that's one of the keys, but there's so many others. I think cutting education uh, cutting funding to education during a pandemic and during a uh, uh, low in the economy is probably one of the worst moves you can make. I think make uh, uh, not investing in our, our our students who have special needs is absolutely disastrous. I think that uh, investing in post secondary education. I mean, we have a we have a, a we're known around the world as having one of the best post secondary institutions, and uh, to lose that would be devastating. It would just make everything so much worse. Um, using public dollars, using public pensions to to buy pipelines that we have no control over whether they'll be built because of the United States. Um, these are all very, very poor decisions. Um, 
I don't know. Is that enough? I could go on. I don't know how much time you have, Ryan. <laughs> well, I've got, I do have another question for you. Um, but, but Stephen, let me just say something. I, I kind of get, I don't know if I can just like, here's how I would talk to you over a beer. Uh, you, you, you sort of, you sort of wrap everything up. It, it seems like you wrap up every thought by going anyway, I just, you know, blah, blah. but, but I want you to know that like you're speaking uh, the, the way that our comments are going right now and the way that, that my Twitter mentions and, and even my, my personal phone receiving text messages, you're speaking for thousands of people right now right i mean i know that you the frustration is is evident in your voice because i think you're so passionate and because you care so much um but you're, you're speaking on behalf of thousands of people right now which is a hugely important thing that you're doing um let me ask you before we go about stripping trades of compulsory status uh, w this is something i know that you told me specifically you wanted to touch on <clears throat> what does this mean and why is it such a big deal Okay, so one of the biggest problems with this, and it really, really grinds my gears. Um, it, it, so, and you're seeing this, right? You're seeing a government that actually is more invested in corporations than they are in working people. I don't love oil and gas. I do love oil and gas workers. And that's the difference, and they should be on our side too. What they're doing, so a compulsory trade. So if you're an electrician, you wanna be an electrician, you wanna work as an electrician, putting electrical panels together, you have to have a certification. It would be illegal for you to work on somebody else's house if you did not have that, uh, if you did not have the proper qualifications from a post-secondary institution. Now, the, from what I've heard, and I mean, this is one of the things with this government is it's a blitzkrieg. It is a just bomb after bomb after bomb. Like you cannot keep up. I've talked to some of the opposition MLAs and they're having a tough time keeping up. But from my understanding, the UCP are looking at um, decertifying 16 of these trades, so it won't require a trade ticket, it won't require certification, it won't require post-secondary education. Now, why are they doing that? Well, the only reason I can see why you would want somebody less educated is so that corporations can pay them less. And that is one of the, I mean, whenever anybody out there thinks like, oh, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to support the UCP because they support oil and gas. They support oil and gas corporations they don't give one hot damn about oil and gas workers you look at how they've uh, they've taken away overtime right banked overtime you know I, you want to be away from your family and get paid straight time like it's unbelievable and I, I, i've never I, I never in my entire life thought that somebody could do such a make such a mess in such a short period of time and i am i'm furious i mean this is i, I it, you know I, I spend my entire life trying to to help students get certification, get credentials, have a well-paying job, have a great quality of life. And I watch this government take that away from our kids, from our families, from, uh, for their families. Why? So that PetroCanada or Shell or, or some other multi-billion dollar corporation can make some more money and give more dividends. But take care of Albertans first. That's what needs to happen. Steven Anderson, fourth generation Alberta millwright a teacher. You can find him on Twitter. We link to our guests uh, from my profile at Ryan Jesperson each and every morning. Appreciate you bringing the fire today, pal. Keep fighting the good fight and thanks for what you do in educating Alberta students and preparing them for the, the job market and the reality of tomorrow. Thanks for having me, Ryan. You got it. Give you uh, a real, I, honestly, uh, I would say you got to follow Stephen on Twitter. The guys, I mean, I even if you don't align with him politically or whatever, I mean, the passion there, the experience too. He's got an important voice. That's a really important voice. Somebody that's that's worked uh, family history plus his own professional history. He's seen a lot, right? What are you going to tell him about coal-fired power generation? What are you going to tell him about refineries or Fort McMurray or oil and gas? The guy's done it. The guy's lived it. He's walked those miles in those boots. It's a really important perspective. And we want to hear more of those. I mean, if you're listening or you're watching that right now and you're going, hang on a second, he's way off on this, that, and the other. And, and, and quite frankly, I've got a perspective I think people need to hear about. Be in touch with us. We're not trying to build teams here. We're not trying to build camps. We're not designing this to be a show where if you align with our perspective on everything here, then you're really going to like this show. But if you, if you feel this way about this, then buzz off, beat it. That's not the type of show that we're doing whatsoever not even close want to introduce you to another one of our partners that we're really proud to have on board this is the team at alta moving and storage they are all about i mean first of all obviously the storage uh, the implication there you're looking for short term or longer term storage they've got you covered but what i think is really booming for them now and what really is 
going to boom because it's changing the trends on how people are moving and how people are downsizing or upsizing, making these adjustments to their lives, these pod style containers. You get in touch with them. The team at Alta Moving and Storage wants to find a solution that's perfect for you. They'll drop off these pod style containers. Now you can either load them up. You want to use those eco-friendly frog boxes. They can hook you up with those too. Or they can provide movers that can do all the heavy lifting for you. The pod goes to the new location. They unload it. You or whatever. You know how it goes. They're going to determine a custom solution for you that works. And the team at Alta Moving and Storage, based on the fact that they're local, employing local people, operating locally, well, they know that customer referrals are super important. And so they want to make sure that you are happy. You can get in touch with them anytime at 780-993-ALTA or visit the sponsors link at Ryan Jesperson. Com. Gene Prince may in just a moment. Let's take a look at the headlines. Here's what's making news today. Just after 930 on this Monday, vaccinations begin here in Canada this morning. That's the story. The COVID-19 vaccination. We're talking about the Pfizer BioNTech vaccination. Here's where it all begins. Kind of feels weird to say it, right? We've been looking forward to this for a long time, haven't we? I mean, either theoretically or tangibly, once we learned that there was a vaccine developed and ready to go. So now it begins. How long will the rollout take? Will it be seamless? Let's all be as patient as we can. I know many of you are eager. And of course, we're going to be looking into stories about those of you that maybe aren't so eager either, including a conversation last week with Dr. Sajad Fazel. You can find that anywhere you get your podcasts. This two-dose vaccine is showing signs of being 95% effective in preventing COVID-19 in large-scale trials, so no wonder people are optimistic about it. Meantime, a, an angle we told you about last week, British authorities clarifying concerns Uh, When they talked about those severe allergic reactions, you remember hearing that two people that received the vaccine in Europe were showing, went into anaphylactic shock. Well, uh, British authorities have clarified their concerns, saying this vaccine should not be given to anyone who's ever had an anaphylactic reaction to a vaccine, to prescription medication, or to food. They say it's a very rare scenario. Plus, Alberta's COVID-19 numbers, more than 1,700 new cases. This, as of Sunday, 1,717 new cases. That includes 22 deaths, 719 total. That's 719 Albertans that have died, 719 Albertans that won't see the holidays. 136 Albertans fighting right now in ICU. We'll get to another news update at the top of the clock coming up at 10 o'clock, and then we'll check in with palliative care and family physician Dr. Amy Tan, who has an interesting perspective on how the holidays will be different this year for her family. She looks back uh, to a holiday season previous years ago, also a different one for her family, and offers some pretty meaningful reflections. We're also going to get into more of the data that you provided as part of our Get Real question of the week we have the results in from the first week Uh, more than 300 of you took part we're grateful for that we know that number will continue to grow 300 after week one pretty darn good we're endeavoring to get several thousand as part of our real talk panel that'll give us really really meaningful statistical data as we put questions in front of you relevant to the news of the day i'm looking forward to this conversation uh i think whether you're a sports fan whether you're a hockey nut or not you'll likely be paying close attention to the nhl's return to play it's scheduled for january 13th looking to get the players back in action but there's going to be a lot of uh, different realities including divisional play and the length of the season of course how the players will be monitored health-wise and everything else and the intrepid nhl host the star of Rogers Sportsnet, the Alberta institution that is Gene Principe, will be covering this all for Canada's most watched uh, NHL broadcast, making his Real Talk debut this morning. Gino, uh, welcome. Hey, I'm going to give myself a pat on the back with that kind of introduction. That was, you read it just like I wrote it. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, you got it. Well, hey, you know I'm, I'm a huge fan of your work, and, and well, it wouldn't have been... Versa, yeah. uh, well, thank you, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't be able to say that I interviewed Gene Principe and put in an honest effort unless I teed you up to say something like, um, you know, the NHL is hoping that enthusiasm around this COVID-19 shortened season will be contagious. They hope that the fan base continues to spread as they bring the game. But, well, you're the master. You're you're Uh, the art of the pun, Gene. I should just get out of the way. No, you know what, Ryan? Listen, I I will say this. Uh, First of all, hello to you and uh, all of uh, those out there watching Real Talk. Uh, over the last few years, uh, the world has changed a lot. And what I what I could do, and 
what I should do has also changed. And I have given some thought as we get word that the NHL will be starting a few weeks, maybe six weeks, somewhere in January, hopefully, fingers crossed. I'm already starting to think about what's okay and what's not okay. And uh, when it comes to puns, when it comes to props, when it comes to, you know, trying to, to be light and entertaining. But nowadays you have to be careful because it may only take one person to take it. Uh, I, I want to say the wrong way, but to take it their way. And now you got a problem. So it'll be interesting to see, especially with COVID-19, how, it, it, it's it's a it's just a tough topic, and we hope that the vaccines show up. I was just listening to you. It sounds great that they're you know either here or arriving, uh, but I'm looking forward to having some fun and uh, just enjoying myself. And last point on it, I remember when Mr. Trump, Donald, uh, was uh, brought into the White House November of I think it was 2016. 16, right? Yeah. right? Well, that's and when I the election my... was. Yeah, and then he was inaugurated. Right. And, yeah. yeah. Right. So when, when he was won the election, uh, we were on the road with the Oilers and anyways, came back. And, you know, I, I remember my son had gone, worn a Donald Trump mask for Halloween. So I wore it on the air the night that, that he won or when he was inaugurated. And I thought, if I did that now, uh, well, first of all, I wouldn't do that now. But there's no way I could pass that through producers and yeah. just different people. They'd be like, you can't you can't do it. So anyways, long answer. I'm just looking forward to having some fun. It's been a it's been a long year, a rough year, a tough year, uh, a sad year for so many people that hopefully the new year brings with it uh, vaccines, some sports, some NHL, and some enjoyment. No kidding. And well said, Gino. You know, I, I actually, I was thinking the exact same thing um, watching Saturday Night Live. Uh, so, so here's the thing. So we had Sarah Kenzier on the show earlier today, a, a podcaster with Gaslit Nation and just a, a remarkable talent, a uh, real spitfire for sure. And I'm listening to one of her podcasts, and, and she's talking with her co-host about how American deaths due to COVID-19 on the trajectory they're on, and, and this is a number that will stop you in your tracks, uh, they're expecting that 400,000 Americans will have lost their lives to COVID-19 by January, by the end of January, uh, wow. which is equivalent. And you would say, well, why the end of January? Why are you pulling that out? That's a random stat. What they were doing, these statisticians, is trying to determine when the COVID death toll would equal America's World War II death toll Holy. and they're forecasting oh. that to be the end of january so so gino i'm listening to this Four hundred thousand americans forecasted to die by the end of january and then i'm watching in the background saturday night live and just this past weekend they had a skit about you know a, basically a, a covid 19 family like a family of, of actual mm. covid i don't even know the scientific terminology but but basically the virus as a as a human yeah. entity and and obviously i think comedy is a way that society can approach difficult subjects. I, I, I've always pointed out that the first people back on the air after September 11th were the late night stand up talk hosts. They were the first ones back because comedy makes difficult subject matter accessible. But you're right. It is. It, it's you, you. You have to find that fine line where you know you you can wisecrack about it. I think in in one hand because it's dark humor and it allows people to sort of maybe blow off a little bit of steam and acknowledge what's going on around them. But at the same time. Uh, for someone that's just lost a loved one to COVID-19, they may not have an appetite yeah. for the humor, right? Well, and I think, you know, you, you, Saturday Night Live is a perfect, I mean, I, my wife, and uh, she likes uh, King of Queens. And so, you know, you see some repeats and uh, uh, I can't remember the, the actors. Uh, I know it's Leah Rem Remini. Remini and uh, Kevin, uh, what's his face? What's his yeah. Oh my God. Paul he Blart, the, he's the mall cop, Paul Blart. Paul Blart, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, you see some shows from kind of the mid- 2004, five, six, somewhere in there. And, and we sometimes we look at each other and go, I don't know if you could get away with that. But yeah. I will say this, Saturday Night Live, if you're watching The King of Queens or Saturday Night Live or whatever comedic show that you watch, something current, uh, I, I mean, I, I think that you have to understand that it's a comedy and you're not quite sure what they're going to use as their material. So I, I, I think it would be wrong to watch shows that are comedic and then go, well, I didn't like what they said. I mean, they're, they're in the comedy business. And right now the whole world is talking about COVID. There is a line there, but uh, you know, if you're watching Saturday Night Live and you don't like their material, just, just kind of don't watch Saturday Night Live. I wouldn't say 
uh, critique it or go on social media, but that's what people do now. I mean, it's, you know, we never used, we just had our opinions sitting at the, at the dining room table and that's as far as they went and now they go everywhere. So is there good in that? Sure. Is there some negative to it? I, I would have to say so as well. Yeah, uh, Gene, you can you can see afterward uh, one of the cool things when we when we post our broadcast, so we're streaming live at you at YouTube, but but later when you post it, you can still see the live comments. So if you get a chance, if 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 you feel like stroking, I know you're a humble guy, but if you want to stroke the old ego today, you can go back and you can read all the comments. People are just like people are like in all caps like screaming the prince of puns and gino <laughs> peter the pun master himself uh oh. cam tate our buddy taters watching right now wants oh, yeah. me to, wants me to yeah, say hi course, to you cam. marco says yeah. marco says here we are the most controversial guest of all time on real talk gene <laughs> principe uh, gino <laughs> how are you how are you <laughs> he might be right uh, how 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 are you preparing for this because i mean you know obviously these players what a what a topsy turvy wrap up to last yeah. season. Um, I think, quite frankly, everybody in Edmonton hit it out of the park with the bubble, and a lot of credit, obviously, to the National Hockey League and Oilers Entertainment Group. And and we see the Tampa Bay Lightning lift their raise their second cup, and uh, you know I think after looking to avenge maybe uh, the year before, and, and then now all of a sudden we're back at it. October felt a little strange. No no hockey. Yeah. you know, preseason wise, how, are, how are you? So a January, a shortened season and all Canadian division. I mean, how are you wrapping your mind around what we're going to see here? Yeah, I think it's going to be great. And I think one of the things that uh, the Oilers, well, every NHL team that was in the bubble, whether it be Edmonton or Toronto uh, back in the summer, I mean, the camp was, was short and they had uh, half of March, April, May, June, part of July, almost five months off, four to five months. And it was a very quick camp and boom, they were up and running. And so I like the idea that it'll be similar to that again. And I think as you know, Ryan, and you know, back in the old days, the seventies, eighties, sixties, you know, the old story guys would go to camp, get themselves in shape. Well, these guys are in great shape before they get to camp. And then they just iron out little, uh, little idiosyncrasies that uh, they want to get straight before the season begins. I'm really excited. I mean, it's, the, the, the summer was fantastic, but it was strange going to the rink when it was plus 28 and we had a beautiful summer here. I remember one day, uh, it was like plus 33 and I was headed to the rink. I'm like, wait a minute. Okay. Maybe in June, if I'm in Tampa Bay covering the Stanley cup final, that makes some sense. But in Edmonton, it feels a bit strange to be covering hockey in July and, and August and into September, but it was, it was wonderful. And I think most importantly that it was safe. Um, and uh, we got through a, a long stretch in two Canadian cities and nothing you know, bad happened. There were some injuries which happened in hockey, but there wasn't any kind of, outbreak and a bunch of tests uh, that were were positive to COVID. So that was fantastic. Then we all go home when we're supposed to be in the rink. And now we await the start in January. So I think it's going to be great. And I think the Oilers as, you know, the team and the city where you work in, there's lots of excitement, always uncertainty. Uh, but when you got Connor and Leon, there's, uh, there's a sense that some greatness could occur, not only for those two, uh, but for the team. So uh, I'm looking forward to things getting kind of ironed out and get all the details, not just sort of the proposed details. And then all Canadian, I, I mean, it, who would have thunk it um, that this would be the case? It's not official, but I assume that that will soon become official as soon as we know uh, dates and schedule. And it'll be great. We get to see all Canadian division and we get to kind of hang out within our own country, which is, you know, probably pretty safe right now instead of going back and forth. So I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, and and just I mean something different. I, some people are are saying that they hate the idea. I think it's going to be interesting and different. Um, I, I don't know. You know, someone's describing it as gimmicky. I, I don't know about that. I think it's more pragmatic. Um, on on a side yeah. note, one of the cool things that we can do here in a live broadcast, Gene, is go back and circle back. And we're getting some really interesting comments on 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 um, you know dark humor and and whether or not the Prince of Puns can can you know reference COVID in in your openers and things yeah. like that. And interesting to hear from Lauren who says dark humor is so important as a coping mechanism. I happen to know Lauren um, served Edmonton as district fire chief for many years. Uh, and how about this? This puts you in, in rarefied air. Uh, listener here says, this is Scott, says, hey, Shakespeare himself would put comedy uh, the next scene after the death of a character to break the tension. So there you have it. Yeah. Even the yeah, bar. I don't know. Did, yeah, did Shakespeare have a boss, though? Yeah, that's, uh, right. that's You know? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, right? Like you, you, you know, I, I, I love the idea. I mean, 
I think that when, when people are tuning into a hockey game or a sports event, they want entertainment. Um, I think by now, good, bad, or indifferent, people sort of know what, what I try to bring. Um, but yeah, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be different because, you know, how do you, how do you make comments um, about something that could cost the U.S. 400,000 lives in the next, yeah. you know, not in the next, but by the time the next six weeks are through. So I, I think it'll be, uh, it'll be important to have layers so that you pass stuff through people um, so that they can kind of go, you know what, I think that's probably not safe. So I think I'll just try and stick to some of the old, old material talking about players, maybe names, you know, that kind of stuff. And we'll just have to see how, how COVID goes, but I'll just be happy to be talking about hockey, whether it's, no with kidding. Puns, you know, or, or without, I just, I just, no kidding, Gino. Like I, I just, it's going to feel, and I mean, I, I know I'm dreaming. I don't think, I mean, you can speculate if you want. I, I don't think that there's going to be fans in the stands, uh, and, and this is not based on anything. I don't have inside track on anything. I've not talked to anybody. I'm just guessing. Um, I would be really surprised to see fans in the stands, at least in Canadian markets. I mean, everybody's talking about Florida is going to have like a full barn because uh, Florida doesn't believe in COVID. But um, I'll be, I'd be curious to see. But just but just some normalcy. You know, I mean, uh, yes, I'd love the T-shirt toss. And yes, I'd love, as I yeah, said earlier. To, yeah, I mean, man, oh, man. Um, to have, yeah. you know, I'd love to see people spilling beer on each other on a Saturday night and everybody cheering <laughs> and, you know, singing. Kiss cam. Kiss, smooch cam. Or you, oh, can yeah. you, how far away does smooch cam feel right now? Can you imagine? But, but. Well, um, I did, yeah, you're right. Yeah. I don't know, but it, but just, just bringing, giving people something, uh, you know, to, to sort of, you know, everybody right now, I don't want to say stuck in a rut because I'm so proud of how people have been so resilient and, but, but like people are going nuts at home and, and people, you mm. know, having something like sport, uh, to either unite or in a fun way to divide us, I think is so important. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I think that, you know, it's, it's been nice. Um, you know, when we had that, that first lockdown, everything was kind of shut down. And then things started, you know, to come back. I watched a lot of soccer overseas and that came back and baseball came back and hockey came back and, you know, both soccer in, in North America. So it was, it was nice to have it back. And now we've sort of been watching, you know, from afar, we you know we missed the Eskimo season and now it's great to see they've got a schedule out and they're planning on playing, but we need something. I think that you can kind of call your own, uh, whether you're an Oilers fan or you're a fan of the Canucks or, you know, pick a team. Uh, pick a squad that you support and, you know, in many cases have supported uh, much or all of your life. So I, I don't think, and I do agree with you, like I think getting fans in for this 56 game set will be, that will be really, really difficult. I uh, Going back to what you were talking about, we'll have to see how the vaccine gets, gets sort of passed out, how effective it is, if it is 95%. And, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, there will be a small sample size as as we work our way through yeah. from you know maybe in maybe in april they can they can try something and have 2000 fans at rogers place but i'm like you i don't have any inside information uh, all we have is the idea that for now there will not be fans but i you know i kind of liked uh, during the summer fans were having their own sort of little little parties and they'll have to be very little uh, especially with this uh, latest covid numbers but just having a chance to cheer for your favorite squad. I mean, uh, I think that in itself is uh, appealing and soothing to those of us that have been stuck inside or been dealing with people who aren't feeling well and, and just been dealing with, hey, listen, lots of bad news, unfortunately. Yeah. So true. Uh, Gene Prince pays our guest, uh, NHL host and reporter for Sportsnet. Uh, more with Gene in just a second. I'm, I'm curious for his predictions on how Canadian teams are going to fare this year. Uh, wanted to remind you that we're on air right now. Uh, thanks in part to the work of the team at Westworld Computers for more than 40 years. This family owned business has been providing uh, sales and service uh, through that Apple lineup to customers in and around Vancouver. Edmonton, Calgary, proudly Western Canadian based. And the big thing for them is their personal relationships. So we're talking on the sales side, whether it's a new iPhone that you're looking for, or maybe you need service on your desktop, on your iMac, or, or maybe you're looking to overhaul your entire office, your creative space, whatever the case may be. They can help you dream it up and execute it. Give Daryl and his team a call at Westworld Computers. You'll find the link there under the Sponsors tab at RyanJesperson.com. We're also very grateful to have our hashtag powered by Park Power. Park Power is your friendly local utilities provider offering, offering internet, 
electricity and natural gas in Alberta. So you got to pay for that. You got to pay somebody. Why not pay the company that's owned locally, employing local people, including in customer service in their call centers, and giving back their profit sharing with nonprofits, with charities here in the province of Alberta. You'll find them at parkpower.ca and on every social media platform, including TikTok. Is your current power provider on TikTok? Why not? Park Power, of course, powers the Real Talk RJ hashtag as we welcome back to the show NHL host, analyst, reporter with Sportsnet, Gene Principe. You can follow him on Twitter at Gene Principe. And Gene, taking a look at our hashtag, this is a compliment from Terry, uh, sort of in an underhanded way. Uh, she says, I've been forced to watch a lot of hockey and I've always looked forward to Gene Principe and his silly jokes. What a treat to hear him this morning on Real Talk. So there you go. Terry's been forced to watch, but you make yeah. it much less painful. Yeah. That's funny. Well, speaking of painful, I know my family's about ready for me to go back to work because they're really my only <laughs> audience uh, that I have. So I think they're they're getting tired of it. But they've been they're a great test audience to see uh, if you know the, the the bigger the groan, the more likely I'm going to use it. There you go. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm looking. For, I'm really looking forward to it. I mean. It, uh, you know, you've got this avenue that that just kind of spruces up your day, right? And you're so involved with people, and that's one of the things that we are able to do. Is I don't I don't want to overstate, make a difference in people's lives, but we are part of people's lives if they watch real talk, if they tune into the Oilers on sports, and it's great. I love that. I love being a part of it. Yeah, well, you bring joy to people, Gino. Um, are are you, by the way, just? And I'm not going to keep focusing, circling back on this, but I just so are you? Are you? Do you have like the worst? dad jokes of all time like i mean uh, the best is what i mean but like yeah. the worst yeah yeah well you know i definitely try and react and respond to things that i uh you know see and hear and you know it all started real quick back in uh you know in 06 uh, after the Oilers cup run to game seven and the next year was just a just unfortunately not a very good year for them and i remember the last uh 20 games they only won two games and I was kind of like, uh, you know, I'm born and raised in Edmonton and, and not on TV, but off TV. I'm an Oilers fan. And I was like, boy, this is just getting, this is difficult, right? Fans are down. And so I thought, I don't need to hit them with, you know, lost five in a row and their goals against average is this. And they've got one power play goal in their last 30 attempts. I said, let's, let's try and find something uplifting and positive. And, you know, then slowly got involved with sort of being entertaining or trying to be entertaining. And then. You know, I'm like the kid in class that talks too much. And then every once in a while, the boss says, slash teacher says, you know, just go sit over there for a little bit and quiet down. And yeah. I do. And then you come back up. So, yeah, it's been lots of great people and lots of great support from people in the, you know, basically on Twitter, social media in person, because I think if everything was negative about my work, you kind of might go, maybe this isn't working. But, you know, you, you get good, you get bad, you get those in the middle. And so uh, I, I'm happy to keep doing what I'm doing as long as I can. Yeah, no kidding. Well, I hope that you're doing it forever. Um, so let's take a look at the landscape across Canada. So, some interesting, I think Vancouver retooled rather quickly. Um, they've, yeah. got, they've, got a, they've got a Stanley Cup winning goaltender now in, in Braden Holby. Uh, Elias Pettersson looks like maybe the second coming of Marcus Nasland uh, in a certain context. Uh, Vancouver's looking strong. Uh, Quinn Hughes on the blue line, unbelievable. Yeah. Edmonton, we've talked about Edmonton. You know, the top two scorers in the league, arguably the two best players in the league, uh, at least two of the top five. Um, you know, Calgary's got its own challenges, but, but Calgary can also prove to be a bit of a wild card. Toronto always has high expectations. Winnipeg, I think has, has failed to meet expectations over the past couple of years. And you could probably say that their windows closing a little bit with, with leadership, like, you know, like Blake Wheeler and some of their, some of their more aging, uh, veterans, Montreal's got a rabid fan base, of course, but I, I would suggest that they're probably not close at this point to a Stanley cup. What, what observations are you making, taking a look at Canadian teams? And I mean, geez, how cool is it going to be to see them playing each other so often, but who do you think emerges on top out of Canada's teams this year? You know, I, and, and people might say it's because I, I live here and I cover them, but I think Edmonton's going to be really close to the top. I mean, they were the top Canadian team last year uh, before the pause and were, you know, who knows what would have happened. We know what did happen in the qualifying round with Chicago, but I, I think with Connor and Leon a year older, and I think, you know, also a year better. I, I like what Ken Holland has done with the team. He's kind of tinkered and with the loss of Clef Bomb, we believe for, well, let's just say he's out for the year. We don't know, but anything uh, less will be uh, great. Um, and they've added Tyson Berry. I just want to 
There we go. Sorry, having a little technical issue there. Um, they've added Tyson Berry, and uh, I, I think Edmonton will be fine. Lots of people are worried about their goaltending. Their goaltending was was actually quite good uh, during the regular season. And those four games during the qualifying round, Ryan, I, I don't know how much you put into that. You have to put some into that. You can't just wash it away. But I also don't think you, you want to react and not overreact. I love the idea of seeing guys like Austin Matthews and, and Mitch Marner on a regular basis. I, I, I like the fact that the Battle of Alberta, which really got spruced up last year, will have even more meetings. The situation with Vancouver, I mean, that's that's really uh, going to be sort of beautiful hockey, I think, because of those players you mentioned on the Canucks and the players that the Oilers have. So I, I, I like a lot of it. In Winnipeg, you're right. I, I do agree the window is starting to close, but they still have some some strong players and they got the Vezina Trophy winner. So it's a toss-up. Yeah. But what I, I think I like most about the Canadian division is that it should be high scoring. It should be entertaining. And it's all Canadian. I, I mean, 56 games, let's split them up. Let's have them go at it. And you're, you're fighting for national pride. I, I know there's players from all over the world, but there is a sense of pride when you play for a Canadian team and that you're re representing this country. So I think it'll be great. I, I think those that are detractors and are like, ah, it's a gimmick, like you mentioned, I think by the end of it or during it, they're going to say, you know what? I kind of like this. I yeah. like this, and I think it'll work. Well, and, and even if it is, and, and by the way, everyone at home wondering, why are we not seeing uh, Gene's beautiful face? And uh, uh, Gene, we've lost your video feed, but we can still hear you loud and clear. So, uh, but but everyone gets to watch me intently listen to you. So there you go. Um, I agree with you. I think that it, it may be, it's not gimmicky in like a fox glowing puck gimmicky way. Uh, it's it's right. It's pragmatic. It's pragmatic in the sense that yeah. if you want hockey, these are some of the things that we're going to have yeah. to do. Um, and it's not going to be forever. So I'm looking forward to it. Gene, it's 10 o'clock. We promised that we'd let you go. And I've got to get to our next guest. But I'm so grateful to have you here making your debut. Uh, you know I'm a huge fan of yours. And I look forward to the next time that we can see our paths cross in person, my man. Yeah, I look forward to it. When it comes to puns, I'll just keep trying. <laughs> Jesperson. There you go. Hey, buddy. Yeah, thanks, pal. That's the great Gene Principe, the prince of puns, as they call him. Uh, let me tell you a little story. This is going to make us uh, late into the news headlines, but th th there's really not such a thing here because we don't really have any rules anymore, do we? We can get to the news when we get to the news. So I'll get to the news when I get to the news because I want to tell you this story about Gene Principe, um, and, and I wouldn't have told it when he was here because it might make him blush. But I get uh, so I start my television career down in Red Deer, Alberta, and I'm employed at that time for City TV, uh, which uh, was owned at the time by Chum Broadcasting out of Toronto. Uh, not exactly huge in the hockey market, but they would soon be acquired. Uh, well, we were acquired by CTV Globe Media, then by Rogers. Okay, there were some sales transitions. You're going, what's the point here? Well, Rogers, of course, then went out and secured the big NHL broadcast, right? That that big 12-year deal worth more than, you know, I think it was $6 billion, something like that. And now you look to Rogers as your home of National League hockey, right? Sportsnet, your home of hockey. That's why everybody watches Gene. He's got such a huge audience. But at the time, City TV was not a big player when it came to Oilers hockey, Still had a sports department, stuff like that. So I get tapped on the shoulder this one day, and I'm down in Red Deer. I'm like a cub reporter. I'm a, I'm a videographer, so I'm shooting my own stuff, carrying my own tripod, batteries, cameras, microphones. Still, though, you know, collared shirt because i got to stand in front of the camera and shoot stand-ups, reporter stand-ups. So it's, it's like a, it's a tough gig. Uh, you know, the young pups that are starting out in broadcast days, the young storytellers, it, it's, a, it's a tough hustle, and you're making, like, no dough, and you're working hard and long hours, and you have to have a diverse skill set. You've got to be good in front of the camera. You've got to good, be good behind the camera. You've got to be good at editing. You've got to be good at all of these types of things. And it can be a lot. And it can be intimidating and stressful, especially when you're new. So I get tapped on the shoulder, and I'm based out of Red Deer. Our assignment editor gives me a call that morning. Sean Horkoff is just back from the NHL All-Star break, and they need a shooter, they need a camera operator to go to, at that time, Rexall Place, Edmonton's Old Barn, and, and, and clip him, it's called. Like, interview Sean Horkoff and talk about his time at the All-Star break and all these types of things. 
And I, I'm pretty stoked, right? Because I'm typically, you know, I was in Red Deer reporting as a bureau reporter for, for City TV Edmonton. And so I'd get the stories that were like, you know, there's a forest fire. Can you go out and get us some visuals of this? Or, uh, you know, the, the, the highway conditions are poor. Can you go shoot some video of the highway so we can put it on in Edmonton? And I didn't really get the big assignments. So to, so to go and interview, you know, the, the Oilers All-Star just back from the All-Star break was pretty cool. I was going to get to sign in. I was going to get a... a, a, a a, a temporary NHL press pass, you can imagine. But it's intimidating. So I walk into the rink, and there I see the big scrum. You know, so you've got like, you know, I don't know what it was, eight cameras and all these radio microphones and reporters shoulder to shoulder jostling to get in. And I've just driven up from Red Deer, and I'm looking, and I don't know any of these guys. I mean, I know a lot of the anchors. I know a lot of the familiar faces, uh, because I've seen them on TV, I've watched them, uh, but you act professional, you act like you've been there before. So I'm sort of trying to get in, and I'm like, if I show up to this thing, and I don't get the shot, I don't get the interview, what am I going to tell my boss? What am I going to tell my assignment editor? I mean, I'm going to be screwed, right? I'm going to be totally screwed if I don't get this shot, and it's competitive in there, and they're jostling, and I finally am able to kind of get my camera through. I'm, tr- I'm able to get the lens through the scrum, and I kind of have a bead on Sean Horkoff. Like, I kind of, and I'm zooming in as tight as I can to get the shot, and I'm, my, my, my hand, and I'm trying to, the camera, and, I'm, and, I, and I'm, the sweat is starting to, and all of a sudden, this calming hand comes in and gently takes my microphone, right? Not in a way to take it away, and I look over, and there's the great Gene Principe. And he looks at me. He gives me one of these. with, Like, you're okay, kid. Gives me one of these. And he holds my microphone and his microphone so I can put two hands on the camera and get the shot. And while I was just some no-name, nobody, cub reporter, video journalist up for the day from the Red Deer Bureau of the barely-watched City TV Edmonton, the big shot himself... The prince of puns, Gene Principe, bailed me out. A pure class act, uh, and that was a moment that I will never forget. So I love the guy, and I think you can probably tell because I just took a 10-second story and made it five minutes. Let's get to another one of our sponsors. Want to let you know how grateful we are to have the support of the team at Clean Air Club. I don't want you to panic. I don't want you to be grossed out. But it's very likely that the air that you're breathing in your house right now is nasty. Because let's be honest, it's probably been a while since you changed your furnace filter. You're going to go, Jespo, don't judge me. I was out this weekend. I got my Christmas lights up. I, I picked up after the dogs in the yard for the first time in a couple of weeks. It snowed. Don't blame me. I, you know. I got my grocery shopping done. I organized the pantry. I folded my laundry, but yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. I did not get around to changing the furnace filter. Hey, I've been there. As a matter of fact, I was just kind of describing my weekend in some sort of a weird self-congratulatory way. (laughs) My point is just that sometimes we don't get to everything on our to-do list, and sometimes the things that are really important, like clean air, get set aside. Well, at cleanairclub.ca, they've got you covered. All you do, you go, you sign up right now. I love when you leave us the comments. People are going, every single day they hear this, they go, I'm literally signing up right now. Do yourself a favor. They've got you covered. You send them the size of the filter you need. It's written right on the filter. And then they're going to develop a schedule for you. You don't even have to, I know a lot of, most of us, I hope all of us trying to limit our in-person shopping right now. They're going to pick up your furnace filters, drop them off at your house. Plus there's a local gift a gift from a local artisan that they include that they're really proud to do it's a local company providing local service you know what i like about this club.ca that like furnace filters are stupidly easy to change you just so never easy. have one so easy they just slide right out it's like yeah and they're always disgusting when you pull them out they're so gross when you pull them out like it's it, and and you know what? Yeah, I always and I always treat it like biohazard. Like when I pull it out, because then you like I feel like I need to put it in a bag as soon as I take it out, or else I'm gonna get this lint yes, everywhere. Yes. Yeah. And then you know what I can't? And we're doing this to people right now. We're grossing people out right now. But hey, it's it it's your air, not mine. Don't get mad at me. I'm not judging you. I'm just saying when I, you pull it out and you look at it, and then you think all of the air that was circulating in our home has been circulating through this thing for like the last month. Anyway, cleanairclub.ca. There you have it. So a 10-second story into five minutes, a 30-second commercial in three minutes. 
you know, when, when we first met to start this show, uh, you're just like, oh, there's some of those podcasts that do those three minute long ads. We're not going to do that. We're going to keep them <laughs> yeah, tight. We're going to yeah. keep them 30s. Well, no, but what I said was, yeah, what I meant was we're not going to back to back to back to back commercials <laughs> and make them three minutes. I never said anything about making each commercial three minutes. Someone suggested that we should pod. Some, someone wrote into the. Did you see this feedback at talk at ryanjesperson.com the other day? Somebody said your 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 ad reads, your commercials are so entertaining. You should upload a podcast of just the spots. And, and I thought, okay, well, that's an interesting idea. Our our sponsors would love that sponsors, if our podcast was just one long ad. I think, I think the sponsors <laughs> would be pretty happy about that. They're fun to do. Live yeah. reads are a lot of fun. Oh, they are a lot of fun. And we're having a lot of fun here with you. Thank you for tuning in live. Those of you that are watching us on YouTube right now, uh, those of you that are tuned in on Mixler, which is our live streaming audio via ryanjesperson.com, and of course, those of you who will be listening to the podcast uh, later in the day. I've very much been looking forward to this conversation. Uh, Dr. Amy Tan uh, comes at, uh, she, I mean, she comes to us based on a post uh, that she put out over the weekend talking about how, how her family's holiday season has been different in past and how it's going to be different again. But also, uh, Dr. Tan brings an invaluable perspective as both a family physician and a palliative care physician uh, out of Vancouver Island. Doctor, thank you so much for making time for us this morning and welcome to Real Talk. Thank you so much for having me and congratulations on your new show. Thank you very much. Before, I mean, anytime I'm going to check in with a medical professional, before we start getting into talk about the holidays and, and talk about your perspective personally, uh, what has your COVID frontline looked like? Uh, so it's been varied and it's been an eye-opening, steep learning curve. I started um, the beginning of the pandemic as a frontline family doctor advocating for Northeast Calgarians in Calgary and seeing how all my essential worker patients were needing to advocate for themselves and I was helping them advocate for their safety during the spring lockdown. And now fast forward and I'm now on the Vancouver Island and cases are creeping up here. And so trying to help with, you know, the lessons learned in Calgary with regards to protocols and bringing them here to the unit that I'm now um, medical director of. Was your, uh, was your move um, a, a result of a, a career opportunity or was there something else behind your move from Alberta to BC? I had a feeling you were going to ask me about this. Um, so I, I, I was public about it. Um, I have been advocating this entire 12 months with regards to my concerns with the changes that the UCP government was making to healthcare and to public education in Alberta. And um, that was the impetus to make me look for other opportunities. I'm super grateful for this opportunity and very excited to be in Victoria, but it was the political climate and the changes that um, that caused this move. We thought that we were gonna be on, in Alberta through till retirement. How, with regards to, to, I mean, now that you've, you've been in your new role, you've been in your new surrounding uh, for, for a short while, relatively speaking, um, how have you evaluated the decision and, and, and how are you able to compare based on what you've seen, at least to this point, um, what, you know, the situation, your reality in British Columbia versus your former province of residence in Alberta? So once um, we recover from a pandemic move, which is in and of itself a very stressful feat. Yeah. Um, we are we are loving it here and there's no regrets. Um, there's COVID concerns here as there is with anywhere in Canada and the world right now. But other than COVID concerns and management of the public health crisis, there really is not the vitriol and toxicity on social media or in the common discourse. It's, it's so um, refreshing. To be honest, you, you pro I don't know if you I mean, you talk about vitriol on social media. I look at uh, what what s some healthcare professionals have been put through and some of the comments that they face. And I just uh, if if I didn't want to be so professional, I could tell you how it really makes me feel. But it's infuriating. Um, and and I've seen physicians suggest that um, and many of them have, have signed up on Twitter as a result of this pandemic or through this pandemic to have a voice because I think more and more of them are understanding of the importance of, of firsthand frontline commentary and reality checks. Um, but I've seen many people, you know, in response to physicians that say, Hey, you know, I, I'm very seriously considering either retirement or, or taking, 
you know, picking up my stethoscope and leaving and going to another jurisdiction. And and one of the common uh, things I think that are hurled back at these physicians is that Alberta spends more on health care than anybody else in Canada, that Alberta doctors make more than anybody else in Canada. So, uh, A, no, you're not going to leave. And B, if you do, you're going to take a pay cut. So how smart are you? Uh, you obviously made the decision to leave. What do you say to people that argue, well, doctors in Alberta are making among, if not the most in Canada, so we don't need to worry about these threats that they're going to leave? So the first thing I would say is the numbers that the government, the Alberta government has been putting out is actually gross. So it actually doesn't talk about all the business expenses that physicians have to incur to run an office or to run a practice to buy the equipment. So it's already grossly inflated by the numbers, but even on a, you know, province to province basis, there's other things other than your bottom line take home paycheck. There is whether or not you feel valued, whether or not you feel that there's certainty in the public health system, whether or not you feel that you can actually spend your day doing what you love, which is patient care directly, rather than having to go on Twitter and really try to expose the concerns that you have about how this is going to impact patient care and seeing honestly the suffering that government decisions makes was too hard for me and so that's what really pushed me over to make a change. Uh, Doctor, uh, I want to first of all clarify to our audience and I can be really guilty of this sometimes uh, didn't bring you on to talk about your move from Alberta to BC. Didn't bring you on to talk about uh, trolls on social media. And and we're about halfway through our allotted time here, or the time that we've asked you for. Obviously, you've got a lot on your plate right now. So so l- let me focus our conversation. I think that context is important. But I was so moved by a piece, and and because I didn't know about your personal history, um, and and why would I? And why would other people that have read your essay? Uh, at amytanmd.medium.com. Christmas will be different this year, and it'll be okay. I thought this was going to be a family care physician, a palliative care physician, talking about how our tight family units can gather, and we can be on Zoom, and we can be grateful. Um, But wow, wow. 18 years ago, you as a newlywed uh, saw your entire world turned upside down right around... The holiday season. As a matter of fact, uh, 18 years ago, a couple of weeks ago, um, for those that aren't familiar with the story, can you take us into how you wound up in the ICU clinging to your own life? Sure. So, yeah, it was 2002. We had just gotten married at the end of September. I was a family medicine resident in Edmonton. And I, December 2nd, was driving to my clinic where I was scheduled to work. Um, near the Grey Nuns, and I skidded on black ice and my car teetered over, I don't know how, um, it's a miracle really, teetered over a bridge. I didn't hit oncoming traffic when I went to cross the lane and it fell, my car flipped over and landed on the roof under a bridge. And um, a guardian angel came down. I don't know to this day who that person was because I was upside down and I couldn't see her. But she climbed down the embankment and stayed with me until um, EMS came. And I needed Jaws of Life extrication. And um, I ended up at the Royal Alex for more than three weeks in the ICU and then into the step down ward with three other people. And just what I'm so lucky to be here and be able to work full time. Um, it is something that affects me every day. I broke my back in several places. I had some other lung injuries and hand injuries and and um, hit my head to some degree, but thankfully um, I'm able to function. So grateful every day. Um, but what really got me to write this piece was when I was on national television because I've been advocating for safety um, interventions and protocols with regards to COVID-19 and talking about masks and part of the group Masks for Canada. And a couple of weeks ago, I actually said on national television when I was asked about Christmas and the holidays, and I said that really we shouldn't be traveling and we really should be keeping things small and in the home. And I got quite a few comments about how, you know, I was ruining Christmas and, um, you know, this was really hard to take. And 
And that was right around the same time as the anniversary of my accident on December 2nd. And it really got me thinking that there was a Christmas 18 years ago where the single most important thing to me was getting home and staying in my safety of my house for Christmas to the point where I worked every day to get myself out of bed, to teach myself how to walk again with a plastic orthotic clamshell from my chin to my tailbone. Um, and that was literally my Christmas wish was just to get home. That's how important is, I mean, so you've seen this from both sides as a patient and as a physician as well. How important do you believe is, is motivation like that and how powerful can the mind be or the human spirit or, or however you would describe what it was that was driving you? I think it was incredible. I I'm, I look back at that time and I just remember other than getting home from Christmas, it was all through my six, seven months of being in that clamshell and going through rehab and graduating from 20 minutes sitting up to being able to walk, to be able to get back to work, to be a resident, a family medicine resident full time. All I could tell myself was, I just want my life back. I just want my life back. I just want it to be like it was. Now, of course, life was changed irreversibly but i am fortunate that i was able to get some semblance like i said of full functioning um it took years to be honest i think it probably took a good 10 years to heal physically probably 15 years to be honest to heal emotionally and psychologically yeah, yeah. I, uh, I I was in, involved in a, a really bad wreck in uh, september of 1996 um, but not a, uh, not, Sorry. not, not one that was, uh, that wound me up in the ICU, uh, not one where I broke my back. I would not compare the crashes, but, but a, a big rollover at, uh, at, a, at a high rate of speed on the trans Canada highway. It was bad. Uh, wow. and, and now you're lucky too. I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky. There were five people in the vehicle. All five people survived. Uh, the car was, wow. a, was a, a total write off. Um, and it was, it was but, but I'll tell you the, the point I'm getting at is that um, I still doctor like when you were describing roll, I mean, you, you're plummeting off a bridge. Geez. I mean, but but landing on the roof, we landed in water. I, I you were you were triggering emotions like I was it, it was triggering something within me as I was hearing you describe it. And you talk about 15 years of emotional healing. I'm not even sure that I still am 100. Like I didn't get into a vehicle for a long time after. And even if I did get in, I, I yeah. didn't want anybody else to drive. Um, and I, I yeah. was, it, it really impacted me for a long time. Um, I, I think that's gotta be normal. I think that's gotta be normal for somebody that survives yeah. a traumatic incident like that. Oh yes. And, and I, I started uh, PTSD counseling two weeks into my accident yeah. because I really knew that in order for me to have some hope of um, recovery from the nightmares and the flashbacks and being able to drive um, all in the guise of trying to get back to quote unquote normal um, that that was going to be needed. So there was physiotherapy and there was also psychological therapy. Absolutely. That had to so you, so you make this happen 18 years ago, um, you've gone through the physical therapy. You obviously have a long road uh, ahead, your healing journey, but you get home in time for mm -hmm. Christmas. What did that mean to yeah. you? And what will you for, I mean, you'll remember so many things about that Christmas, but what will you remember most about the influence that that experience had on, on the spirit of that season? Well, honestly, I don't remember a lot of details because mm -hmm. I think the details weren't important. I remember just being home with my husband of two months and just the awe of being alive and having a loved one. And this was before Zoom and Skype and all those things and just short phone calls because, you know, it was hard to talk and I was in a lot of pain. But I knew that people were rooting for me and I knew that people were looking out for myself and my husband and they wish they could be there or, you know, and so none of the actual physical kind of trappings of Christmas were important. All those things evaporated. Really what was the focus was I was alive. I knew I was surrounded by love and care. And like I said, I was home. Um, yeah. And that, that was all I needed. 
it's going to be such a, a difficult Christmas for so many people. We had uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jody Carrington was part of our Friday roundtable uh, just this past Friday, a, a counseling psychologist, and she was talking about, you know, for some people, this is it's going to be difficult for them to follow you know, public health directives, you know, for example, she said, because some people are going to know that this is their loved ones last Christmas, probably in some circumstances. Um, Other people are going to know that this is their newborn's first Christmas and other family members will be desperate to see them. There are opportunities for, for family reconciliation. So many factors at play that the, that the holidays facilitate that, that are going to be made more difficult now. And it's going to be difficult for people to, to, I think, uh, wrap their minds around, maybe the longer term effects of, of what this holiday season, what people will remember in the context of right. what you're talking about and your experience 18 years ago and your experience as a physician now. And by the way, um, what a rich perspective you have might be a weird word to use, but, but what a, what a deep and meaningful perspective you have as a palliative care physician as well. Um, that requires such sensitivity that requires such a, a wonderful bedside manner. Um, what's your encouragement to the Canadians that are either watching or listening to this live now that are going to be listening later on the podcast, some of them maybe with tears in their eyes because they're thinking about their own family holiday and what they had hoped to happen and how that's not going to happen or how it's going to be different. What's the takeaway that you want to put in front of people? So I was actually on call and working the last two Christmases in hospice. Um, And I would say that Christmas really is about love and the feelings and you know everybody says everybody's kinder around the christmas season we don't need just the christmas season to be kind to each other or to have a quote-unquote excuse to show each other what they mean to us and i think the combination of the lessons i get the privilege of learning every day from my patients in hospice as they reflect on their life and the experience i went through 18 years ago really reminds me that we should be reaching out at any time to express thanks and appreciation. And we don't need a day. We don't need a season to remind us of that. And I would say to to Canadians, yes, there are absolute traditions, but we can defer those traditions. We can connect virtually right now because if the traditions and and the gathering is important, those can come as long as everybody stays healthy. And for those who are really close to the end, like my patients who are in hospice this year, there are visitor you know, guidelines to enable that type of visiting. But for the most part, we're talking the majority of Canadians, the celebration in person with, the, with all of the things that make for great photos can happen when this public health crisis is over, but we can still distill the holidays to those essential feelings and express them virtually right now uh dr amy tan our guest uh doctor bit of a curveball here uh because we always want to leave room for audience questions audience feedback and this is i think a very fair question um you can get into it as much as you like or not uh from greg who's watching this morning on youtube he says i'd be really curious to know what dr tan thinks about the assisted dying bill now that's in front of the senate he's talking about c7 um it's expected that the senate will probably make pretty significant changes to this before it goes back to the house um one of the big changes that I've seen or big proposed changes is, is around or one of the more significant elements of this is that it removes a reasonably foreseeable death as a requirement for medical assistance in dying. Again, I didn't ask you to come on the show to comment on this. I, I, I might be putting you in a tough spot. If so, just say it's real talk. You just tell us how you feel. That's totally fine. Do you have an opinion on this new legislation? So being a physician in the palliative care realm, it is something that I have to deal with. I've also studied it as um, palliative care physicians and family physicians have learned to navigate this. We didn't learn this in school. This was not something that was part of, you know, even our, on our radar when we, um, a lot of us were going through the training. So what I would say with regards to removing that is there needs to ins- be ensured processes in place to ensure that people are not being exploited or taken advantage of or coerced to make a such decision. If somebody makes that decision of full competent mind, that is one thing and full autonomy needs to be ensured. So I think, you know, you need to look at it from both sides and be able to protect on both sides, both the person's autonomy to make the decision that's right for them and only one person can walk in one person's shoes and absolutely make that decision. But the other side, you have to make sure that there's no exploitation 
or taking advantage or elder abuse that could happen with this. Yeah, I think that's a pretty reasonable uh, comment on it. Uh, let me ask you this in closing. Uh, Dr. Tan, as mentioned, you're a founding member of Masks for Canada, uh, which is a national grassroots advocacy group uh, made up of physicians, scientists, engineers, teachers, and other concerned professionals. I, I'm not showing you this to tick you off, uh, but here's another one of these rallies. Uh, this one here out of downtown Calgary. Uh, this was on December 12th. This was on Saturday. Um I don't know what that is, 150 or so uh, people escorted by police uh, through the street. We're seeing them in Edmonton. I mean, we're seeing them across the country. We're seeing them around the world, uh, these super spreader rallies. Um, your thoughts, your message, what is it? You've, you've planted your flag pretty clearly founding this organization. Um, I think it's unfortunate. I think those that are protesting, unfortunately, haven't been affected by the depravity that this virus can unfortunately wield on people and also on vulnerable populations. We are seeing what COVID-19 is doing with regards to shining a light and exacerbating the inequities in society. And so when I see this, I'm not crying, sorry, I just, my eyes are watering. <laughs> um, when I see this, I, I, I get, you know, I, I have despair because I think it again, shows that we have as a society need to heal we need to look at things um, perhaps from other vantage points and other perspectives of how people in canada live differently and how do we actually take care and protect all of us because no there's nothing like a public health crisis to say none of us are safe until all of us are safe and when you see to, um you know rallies like this it, it just i think adds to that pain overall well dr tan uh alberta's loss is british columbia's gain and we're grateful oh, for you. what you're doing to drive uh, evidence-based compassionate conversation across canada thank you for the work that you do that you don't receive attention for uh, at the bedsides of people in palliative care and thank you for the work that you do do including appearances on shows like this we appreciate your time today thank you so much for having me you can follow Amy Tan on Twitter at Amy Tan MD. And as mentioned, I encourage you to read her piece. Absolutely remarkable. Um, Christmas will be different this year and it'll be okay at Amy Tan MD .com. Appreciate Kathy listening uh, or watching the show this morning on YouTube. She says, uh, Dr. Tan's message is uh, definitely hitting home. Kathy says, I am one of those Albertans who are celebrating a family member's last Christmas. Kathy, our thoughts are with you and with everybody else. I mean, keep in mind, we talked about COVID numbers. More than 700 Alberta families uh, will be mourning. And, and of course, the, the ripple effect of a loss, uh, more than 700 Albertans will not see the holidays this year due to COVID-19. And we know that this is an emotional time. It's why we were particularly interested, and I wanted to get to this just before we wrap, uh, before we thank you for tuning in today to this Monday edition of Real Talk, why our first ever question our Get Real Question of the Week presented by Y Station, who's the official research and strategy sponsor of Real Talk. Why we wanted our first question to be with everything happening around COVID, how do you plan on celebrating the holidays this year? Now, you could choose more than one option, which is why these don't total up to 100%, and there are many other responses we could get into. But here were some of the ones that jumped out at us. 70% of respondents. There were more than 300, by the way, in our first week, which is great. We know that number will continue to grow. As you sign up for the Get Real Question of the Week, we'll be posting today's question a little later on today. Yet family members. Sam, if you could just call that board up again, I want to take a look. 41, percent about 4 in 10 of you will be dropping gifts on doorsteps. About 3 in 10 of you will be enjoying distanced outdoor activities. I saw a whole bunch of people snowboarding. Well, not a whole bunch, but some of you posting photos on Instagram uh, at your favorite mountain resort over the weekend. And about 3% of respondents said that, yeah, you'd be breaking the rules. So based on on our response there. That's about 10 people. About 10 people told us they'd be breaking the rules and it would be business as usual. Also interesting, 7% of respondents, I didn't put this on the graphic, but 7% of you that responded said, you know what, we're skipping the holiday celebrations altogether this year. So we're just not going to do it. We're going to circle back 
and we're going to do it in 2021. And I saw this interesting comment on our YouTube thread this morning. Listener says, you know, we joke about this as a family. This is Chad. Chad, thanks for watching. He says, we joke that Jesus wasn't born on the 25th of December anyway. So why don't we just celebrate Christmas 2020 in June instead? Uh, Sam, you might be onto something. Chad, you could maybe have your family's first ever Christmas on a houseboat in the shoe shop or something like that. You never know. Uh, a Monday morning edition of Real Talk uh, for the Ages. And our thanks to the, the guests that joined us this morning. Morning, including Sarah Kenzie. If you missed that conversation, make sure you check out the podcast. Share it with anybody else you think might be interested. Steven Anderson came in and lit a few fires under us. And then, of course, the great Gene Principe from Sportsnet, in addition to Dr. Amy Tan. We're back at it tomorrow, including a Tuesday exclusive in the afternoon with Dr. Stephen Duckett of Cookie Fame. Make it a great Monday. <laughs>